This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Welcome back, everybody, to Wrestling Omakase. It is episode number 145, and this week I'm very pleased to be joined by a first-time guest, uh, Mr. Liam. Mr. Liam from the Wednesday War Games podcast. Hi, Liam. Wow. This is a very uh, different experience because uh, War Games is so... We just fly by the side of our... Fly by the... What's, what's the saying that the I'm seat of, of The seat of our pants, I think? The seam of our pants where we don't do like any preparation half the time i say i can't do it tonight like an hour before we're supposed to record and there's no preparation we don't i wrote notes this time i haven't written notes for war games since the first episode probably <laughs> um but yes so liam is here uh, as we continue our tour of the voice of wrestling podcasting network and I really, I, I wanted to get you on here for like three months for some reason, and you kept <laughs> refusing based on, oh, I am a university student, I don't have time to do another podcast, but... When, now I'm barely a university <laughs> student, so that's fine. Well, well, we're, well, we barely have a world, so mm. that's, that would be... That's, that, what am that'd I supposed be, to study? <laughs> that's a big difference, I guess. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I listen to Wednesday War Games pretty much every week. I have... Ironically, I have not listened to this week's yet, where you probably talk about the fact that you're going to be on this show. So I, I do. don't, so I don't know what you said. So I'm going to hear. Well, I even, I, was gonna say, I even remembered the like week this time. So that's yeah, good. That's, that's good. But yeah, um, I usually listen, even though I I don't watch Dynamite or NXT. So <laughs> you guys keep me up to date. You guys, and then also Joe Lanza screaming. Uh, ratings numbers. Oh point one three. Oh point two nine. Oh point two five. I think you're arguably our most dedicated listener because you're the only one that actually makes it to the end. Mainly because we shout you out half the time. I think. But. Yes. Um, I mean, the one thing you'll know you'll know about podcasting is it's impossible to tell who the fuck is listening. I can I mean, I I whenever I the only time I ever know people are listening is when. I tweet something like, uh, like okay, a few weeks ago during the when I put up that article about like the uh, the Jap- the different Japanese wrestling promotions, mm-hmm. and uh, somebody I don't want I don't want to say because because <laughs> he might be I don't he could be a listener for all I know somebody got mm-hmm. very somebody got very mad, and I was uh, very annoyed at the entire situation, and I was like you know I put so much of my time and energy into uh promoting japanese wrestling for very little to no pay that i don't know if i should go find something else to do at my time and i had all these people reaching out like who i guess thought i was very serious they're like john i love the podcast you can't stop podcast and i'm like <laughs> you know we really appreciate you don't listen to the trolls on twitter and i'm like okay well where are you guys every week if you listen every <laughs> week but the the thing is like for however number of listeners you have like you have way more listeners than you think you have, right? I think that's what it comes down to. And like people, I only ever heard the first number, and then I was like, <laughs> I don't want to hear anymore. Just let it be a void. But people just don't like. I don't know. People don't talk to you. You know what I mean? Like, like there's people in the in the Discord that do actually talk. You know, pretty much every week now. But like, a lot of people just put this thing on and listen to it either while they're trying to go to sleep or. 
I don't know, back when we had commutes during their commute <laughs> and they never, they don't, they don't give feedback or anything. They're just like, okay, I finished listening to it. Let's see. It. And you think about it. It's like, I listen to so many podcasts weekly. How many of them do I ever give feedback to? And the number's bigger than zero because, you know, as you can tell, listening to this podcast, I have a lot of things to say, but, <laughs> but there's still plenty of podcasts I listen to that I never have communicated with the, you know, with the creators. So that's just, you know, that's how it goes. But well, now I don't. All the podcasts I listen to, I can. I'm in the same Slack as, so now I just talk to them directly. <laughs> that's true. Um, I mean, I do listen. I listen to a bunch of other podcasts that aren't Voice of Wrestling, though. So I listen to a lot of wow. podcasts. Yeah, I, mean, I listen to like anime podcasts and shit. So, uh, but yeah, what was the last non wrestling podcast I listened to? But that's a, actually a weird little transition, I guess. To you know. Um, we're trying to start things out here with a, a positive note, but it's been a very uh, difficult week for mm. for wrestling. Um, I don't want to talk a lot about it. I kind of want this to be, you know, an hour and a half or whatever where we can not think about that because, you know, I know we've lost a lot of people this week. Um, you know, I, I, that bringing to talking about the anime podcast actually made me think of that. In addition to, like all these wrestling people I, weirdly like one of the people i listened to um on the anime news network podcast like also passed away suddenly this week and it's just very it's just a very weird week with a lot of people i i've either know or heard of just like dying and it's just uh you know very tragic and i, I mean this year has been really bad <laughs> you know and i mean mm. like um and liam first of all i want to thank you very much for agreeing to move this podcast back a day because we were supposed to record uh saturday morning my time slash saturday night your time and the the news about uh hanukkah Mura broke like almost exactly at midnight eastern time on s- friday into saturday and yeah that i mean look i'm not i'm not trying to say i didn't care about larry zonka or shag gaspar but that that hana one like really hit me hard and i think you know, I think it hit a lot of people hard just being her being 22 years old and all that. Um, like, I think um, it, for a lot of it, it was a very I think we, we had hope. That was the problem. You know what I mean? Like, we had heard that there was help and then it just out of nowhere. Yeah. There was that just... th- there was that British like wrestling Twitter person that I guess had reached out and said that she thought they were, you know, she heard that Hana was as okay as she could be in the situation or whatever. And yeah, that turned out to not be true, unfortunately. Um, I don't think either of us were up for really talking about wrestling goofs. Yeah. Straight away. I mean, like the, when I, when I messaged you, you were like, I was going to ask you the same thing. Cause it's like, yeah, I mean like I, I did not sleep well that night and you know, um, it was just very, you know, very upset. I mean, that, that was a wrestler that first of all, that I loved, I mean, I loved her as a wrestler going back to like, you know, pretty much since she debuted, I always thought she was, she had a lot of promise and, you know, she was really living up to that promise and, you know, by all accounts, she was really, really nice. And I, and I know it's kind of stupid, but it is as much, you know, I told my, my girlfriend this when she was, you know, trying to console me. It's like, if I hadn't met her at that meet and greet, even for those two minutes, I don't think it would have hit me quite as hard. It's just Mm. that fact that like, I don't know, I just kept replaying those, because she was, like, so incredibly nice after that New York City Stardom show, where, like, so many of the wrestlers um, just, you know, didn't give a shit. And I'm not even, I'm not saying they should have given a shit. I mean, if I was in their position, I don't think I would give a fuck about meeting a bunch of weird Americans either. But... Hana, like, she went out of her way to, like, be so nice to everybody. <laughs> she she sang the Sailor Moon theme song to me because I had a, a Sailor Moon t-shirt on <laughs> under my jacket. And she, like, did a little dance. And I don't know. She was, like, going... She was going out of her way to be... She was basically being so nice to everyone that it was kind of awkward for us. Like, I remember thinking... It left an impression. Yeah. I remember thinking in my head, like, you know, why would you bother being this nice? And I'm sure that's just part of the whole idol deal, and she's just very good at it compared to most of the other wrestlers. But yeah, I mean, she was just such an outgoing and, you know, bubbly personality when we met her, and it was, like, one of those things I kept replaying in my head over and over again after she passed away. But, uh... 
but yeah, it was really, really rough night, and you know, my heart really goes out to her entire family and friends because that one, you know, they're all, all of them were tragic, but that one was just like, what the fuck, man. And I don't want to talk about the details or anything, and um, you know, I don't think people want to hear that, and you can find it online if you. Um, please do not search her name, by the way, and you know, because there's still those pictures are still out there, and you really gotta. You really got to take care. I haven't seen them. Yeah, be very careful if you're out there yeah. searching. I haven't seen them, and I'm, I really hope I never do. Um, you know, and this is a really difficult time for all of us. I, I truly believe that if, um, you know, this coronavirus thing wasn't a thing, she would probably still be with us. Um, that that could Maybe that's wishful thinking on my part, but I, I just think she would have had more of a support network, I guess, and she would have been you know, around people and just to what, I don't, I don't, I don't think this tragedy happens. Um, so this is this year. I, I mean, there's been a huge spike in, you know, in mental health problems because we're all so isolated during this. And, you know, I've, I've had, you know, history with mental health problems, unfortunately. And with, uh, you know, I've lost people to suicide before. And it's very, you know, it's very difficult. And I hope, you know, if you're out there, listening i hope you know that people out there care about you um people would miss you if you're gone there's help available um there's suicide hotlines in every you know in every country and people reminded me when i tweeted about the suicide hotlines to also say you know if you need in-person support you know don't be afraid to go to a hospital or you know i mean people want to help you so if you're listening to this and you're having a very difficult time uh just remember that um so it's going to be a very weird transition from that to wacky pro wrestling, but you know I did want to say that. Um. <laughs> it's important to have that kind of. It'd be I think it'd be worse to just completely ignore the situation. Yeah. So we're going to do our best now for the rest of the show to to get your minds off of what has been a very difficult week, and that's you know kind of what we're here for to to be fun and you know Liam and I are going to agree on some matches and probably argue about some matches so uh yeah last night was uh double or nothing also um mm. you watched the entire show i gave up after three matches so i think <laughs> i from what i've heard people did like the rest of the show better uh the three matches i watched i did not think were very good i mean look and actually mjf versus jungle boy was fine that was probably the yeah. most that was like the most i've ever enjoyed an mjf match that like three and a quarter i slapped on it was uh was by far my favorite MJF match I've ever seen. It, that was a match where like the two of them, if the two of them were much better wrestlers, they it could have been a four star plus match, which some people in the Voice of Wrestling Slack insisted it was, and got very angry at the people who <laughs> it's like you and your bias. And I was like, okay, yeah. two different wrestlers How had. Dare had I think it's only three stars. <laughs> if you two different wrestlers had had that match, look, I mean the. There was like a moment early on where, um, and, and this is like, I think everything that's terrible about MJF, like they do this sequence that looks okay, like this reversal sequence, and then Jungle Boy gets MJF in this body scissors, and MJF like clutches his fucking chest and screams like he's just been shot, and I'm like almost crying with laughter. I, re I went back and like <laughs> replayed that, I'm so glad I had a rewind, because he like, he acted like he fucking was shot. And it was like, um, anyway, so yeah, MJF, uh, a lot of comedy there with MJF getting, uh, and it was a badly applied body scissors too, which is also adds to the comedy. Like, it looked like his legs, like Jungle Boy's legs were barely tight around his waist, and MJF was just like, ah! <laughs> But yeah, very. This is my reaction to watching MJF. I do the same thing. <laughs> ah. It's very. Well, it was very in a war game that you didn't listen to last week. Um, we were saying that MGF doesn't really. It doesn't feel like he knows how to translate his character to being in the ring. It feels like these are just two different entities completely, and they yeah. just don't overlap at all. I, like, I agree because yeah. watching that match, he just came off like a generic, pretty much a generic wrestler, other than the the, the fake knee injury spot. Maybe is the only thing that really seems like a master's character but other than that he just looks like any other like tiny american wrestler yeah it's, it's like i don't know if but we, like, we, this is the specific example we gave was i don't know why mjf this bully heel is doing an armbar <laughs> <laughs> it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me 
He should be doing something where it's like some sort of a flash knockout or some sort of cheap win. Yeah. But no, he just chucks on an armbar. <laughs> it's a tap out. Sure. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, look, it, it, the match wasn't bad. Like, I'm, I just wanted to point that out because that was the part where like that's really sticks with me. But the rest of the match was pretty good, and I thought they did some cool stuff. So I went like three and a quarter. But yeah, I mean, that was more than I expected to enjoy that match. Uh, the ladder match was fucking terrible. Like, I hate ladder matches to begin with, and that one fucking sucked. I don't care. I mean, I gave that one star, I think. But And the, the one star was entirely for Orange Cassidy, who made me laugh. But the rest of the match was, like, oh, I fucking hate Brian Cage. He was the mystery guy, and, like, he's such a, like... I know you're... I think you agree with me on this, actually. The what, voice wrestling slack was, like, marking out. And I'm like, he's this muscle-up, warded guy. Uh, allegedly, I guess I should say. Yeah. This, whoa, this, whoa, whoa. Allegedly. But, like, uh, I'm sorry for listening, Mr. Cage. Please don't beat me up. But, yeah, he, like, <laughs> he's this very muscled-up guy. And, like, he just does all these fucking indie spots. Like, I don't know. He just looks like a guy... He's like a, a fucking video game wrestler. So he looks like there's a guy playing like the, the controller because he did he doesn't like do transitions or selling or like any of the things that make you know good wrestling matches. He just does fucking moves. Here comes a move. They put the input in for an enziguri. They put the input in for a German suplex. Here we go. To be fair, like I think that's fine if you're a certain level on the card. If you're doing mid card four ways, if you're doing X division matches, I think it's fine to just do cool moves. But my problem with Brian Cage is, is like, wh- they they always try to push him sh- to the main event scene. I just don't think he works there. And as we see in AEW, he literally won and is now immediately getting a title shot. Yeah. I mean, and, like, the Path of Cage is, like, one of those things that's too cute by half. And so, you know, for the Path of Rage. Um, I didn't get that reference. <laughs> yeah, it was ECW thing. Who could stop the Path of Cage? I think, oh, my God. But, yeah. Um, but, yeah, he came in I'm and just so did. bumped out. He did his normal, like, okay, the the voice wrestling slack, again, they were, like, a little ahead of us, and because they were on, uh, they were watching on regular pay-per-view, and I was watching on a very legitimate stream, and, because, <laughs> you fuck, I'm not paying $50 for that shit. Anyway. Fight. Thank you, Gareth, well, for look, paying for it. Well, $20, I, I may have paid $20, I'm not paying $50. Uh, mm, anyway. I think that main event is worth 20 to be fair. <laughs> okay. Um, but anyway, so back to Brian Cage. So like they say, they they they're ahead of us, and they know they're ahead of us. So they're like, uh, I think Joe Lanza or Sean Cena is like, uh, you know, the the mystery man's good, and I'm like, holy shit. Um, and we're you know we're way behind. Then the fucking Brian Cage thing hits. I'm just like, ugh. Like my level of disappointment was like. I probably groaned in real life when Brian Cage came out. I was just like, ugh. I can guarantee I groaned in real life and in the Slack where I typed blah. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Like, why do you need Brian Cage? You already have a ward load. You already have an entire roster full of PWG video game guys. Maybe let's sign some non-PWG video game guys. Even if you love PWG video game guys, which I think you do. You have, you don't need another bad one. Like just go get some get get some fucking rest. Like they need some guys who can fucking just wrestle. I don't know. I like I I feel like I made this right a million times. Where the fuck is Drew Gulak? Isn't he a fucking free agent now? Like yeah, they should have had. That's what I was hoping it was gonna be. Yeah, I don't know. Like just give me some fucking wrestlers, please. I'm so fucking sick of this PWG. Zach, bullshit. when are you done with New Japan? <laughs> I don't know. I no Zach can stay there. I don't need him in fucking. Yeah, we need dangerous techers. Um, but yeah, like the so the Brian Cage thing sucked. I thought he was awful in the maps too. Like he came in and was like, it looked like anything. He, well, it looked like he was the, the spots he was doing. It looked like he was half hitting. Like there was an Enziguri that Probably missed by hurt. like. Yeah, yeah, that's true too. Well, like was it Garrett? It was like he he's gonna be injured again in a month anyway. If you don't like him, don't worry. Well, about the, 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 I believe there was like a betting pool already started. <laughs> Uh, the shit on Brian Cage hour. But yes, so he was awful. Uh, the match sucked. And then I didn't like Cody. I, I thought Cody Dust was pretty bad too. I mean, it was like, I mean, I guess I gave it like two and a quarter. So it wasn't like awful, awful. But I thought they were all fine. <laughs> it was so slow. And like, it felt like nothing was happening. It just, I don't know. It just wasn't a good match. And that's the point where I gave up because it was three <laughs> matches. Three matches that I were, you know, bad to find, 
to I guess the MJF match was the best one. Plus the stream was starting to crap out on me more and more, so I was like, eh. And There's like, no point trying to keep up with it if you're already not having fun, and yeah. then it's just like the stream is like, <laughs> yeah. Do yeah. you really want to put the effort in? And like the rest of the card, I was like, oh, and I think up next was oh, did I think up next was what like Penelope Ford and uh. Chris Statlander and I was like, which was actually pretty decent. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I should have. I guess I should have kept. Watching. It sounds the like final every three matches are the good matches. What were the final? It was like I know people are raving about Moxie and Brody Lee. I probably will watch that because I like both guys. Sheeta and Nyla is just as good as Brody and Mox, and the main event, depending on what you're expecting, <laughs> is like, I for me, I gave it like four and a half stars. Um, there was fives being thrown at it though as well. Yeah, I saw. I'm not. I <laughs> I do not like. I am not a big fan Pretty of much. the the stunt matches or whatever. So it's not I, like. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not on in that team. So we'll see. I mean, I'm. I'm sure it's better than be anything. Fair, it's so. like five percent cinematic. Okay. I mean, I just don't. I mean, the Matt Hardy stuff sounds very goofy, but I don't know. <laughs> it's it's Matt Hardy. Yeah. So that's never been my thing personally, but maybe I'll watch it. I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm home locked in my house forever, so I have to have, <laughs> I have plenty of time. Uh, but yeah, there's our there's the official wrestling Omakase double or nothing review. There you go. Um, things happened. Things happened, uh, and now we'll get into our five matches. By the way, before I before I start introduce the first match, um, so Japan might be coming back soon. Uh, they they officially lifted the state of emergency. Uh, or or either they're going to or they have. I don't remember what it, which it was. But yeah, it looks like they're about to lift the state of emergency finally in Tokyo. They're down to very few infections. Um, and it sounds like the way this is going to go is... So from when they lift the state of emergency, mass gatherings up to 50 people will be allowed. Um, so that obviously really wouldn't mean much for, the, for, any, for any shows or crowds in Tokyo. In two weeks, they're going to allow... Uh, uh, gatherings up to 100 people. So you can, I guess, have a small 100-person crowd in Shinkiba or something. And then two weeks after that, it'll be 1,000 people. So at that point, obviously, you know, you could talk about reopening Cork and Hall and getting 1,000 people in there. So, um, you know, which would be more than half full already. A so, very exclusive show. A Wrestle 1 full draw. <laughs> but yeah, I think... So basically, I think we're probably like a month away from some type of shows with crowds if everything goes well so which is kind of what i thought originally when the state of i mean the state of emergency is being lifted a week early which is good clearly i mean they're supposed to be may 31st but the you know they're they're down to so few new infections in japan that they're they're lifting it early in tokyo so you know i but originally i thought maybe like mid to late june for shows and that would be about on schedule so you know, if everything goes well and there isn't a huge increase in infections as they open stuff up, I think we will see Japanese wrestling shows again. Um, in which case, we'll t- once we have stuff on the schedule with crowds, we'll talk about what that means for Omakase. I think at that point, uh, if you like these five matches episodes are not going to go away, they might go behind a Patreon paywall. So pay that money. You might have to pay that money. So we'll see. I mean, they're, 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 if you enjoy these, they're not going anywhere. You might have to pay five bucks a week because I cannot do two <laughs> episodes a week and not get some money. So we'll see how that goes. But yeah, the five matches episodes for people who keep... Because people have asked me a bunch of times, so I guess that means they like it. But yes, yeah, so they're not going to go anywhere once we have real shows again. Um, you know, I, I, but we'll probably cover the real shows on the free episodes and then put the five matches episodes behind the paywall but yeah i mean the pet the the five matches episodes are going to continue no matter what if only because i have like six weeks worth of guests lined up already <laughs> so you know have tons of tons of guests coming up for that but yeah let's get into the first match that you picked liam which was nick and matt jackson versus mm-hmm. brian danielson and roger strong from pwg may 22nd 2009 uh, go the ahead. Hybrid and, Dolphins. The Hybrid Dolphins. Go ahead. Uh, Why did you pick this match? Is there any specific reason you wanted me to watch it? Or did you just love this match? What's What's up with this pick? Well, it wasn't because I necessarily loved this match. It was... I wanted to pick a Young Bucks match. Because... 
to me, the Young Bucks are my favorite tag team ever, and I wanted to represent that in some way. But I also thought of you, and so I thought, I'll pick a match where they get beat up the entire time. Like, viciously beat up. <laughs> Um, and I also, it's a, this night in PWG was actually quite a pivotal night because this is basically when the Bucks started to find themselves as the characters that they are now. Before this, they were basically the lucky, like, oh, come on, baby, baby faces. And on this night, after they beat uh, uh, Two Men of Low Moral Fiber, Kenny Omega and Chuck Taylor, the PWG fans have started to turn against the Bucks, which I think you would have noticed during the match. Yeah, they got booed a bunch. I noticed that too. And so this is really the first night where that starts to kick in. So it's kind of a, a pivotal match in the, the Young Bucks uh, and, and whatever the word I'm trying to think of, law. Let's go with that. So it's like the first time they started to work heel, basically. Or, or like yeah, go in the direction. Actually, was, well, they're not working heel, but the direct, they exactly. would eventually turn heel because of this. It was the first night that the fans decided that they didn't like them, especially in PWG, which basically starts, like kickstarts their entire run. Yeah. Because I remember like they, they show up in Shikara... Which you know, I was I was attending the shows and watching a lot more than uh, PWG. Obviously, I've never been to a PWG show, and I I haven't watched that much of it. But you know, they show up in Jakarta one day as like heel. They start acting heelish randomly. And I'm just like, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> like, why are they suddenly heels? Um, I'm thinking like, especially the the year of King of Trios where they teamed up with uh, Malachi Jackson, mm-hmm. and they were suddenly the randomly they were randomly acting heelish toward him. And, you know, it didn't really make any sense from a Jakara standpoint because they'd always been babyface when they showed up. And someone had to explain to me, it's like, oh, no, they've been they've been heels in PWG for like a year now. Because I think this was like 2010. Or it could have even been 2011. I don't know. Time has no meaning at some point. But yeah. Time is relative. Time is relative. But yeah, they, they basically, had, someone had to explain to me they've been heels for a while in PWG now. So this is probably them bringing it over to Jakara. But yeah, so... They just started randomly acting like jerks one day. <laughs> but yeah, I guess this was the start of that. Um, so basically what went down here was uh, uh, Danielson and Strong, they they wanted to build this match around the Bucks being baby faces. So the more the crowd booed, the more they decided to beat the shit out of them in order for the crowd to come up and start supporting the Bucks. Unfortunately for Matt and Nick's bodies, that didn't work out. Yeah. Um... So, so I didn't love this match. I'll be honest; it was good. There was some stuff I really liked, which you know, I, which was pretty much the yeah, the Bucks getting killed. Um, <laughs> I thought I thought the opening was like pretty disjointed. It was like just kind of felt like dudes slapping each other, and they ended up on the floor, and then stuff just kind of happened. It didn't really seem like there was much of a flow to it. Um, by the time like Matt Jackson was getting chopped fifty times by both guys in the corner. <laughs> That was awesome, and the crowd and the crowd did give it a "this is awesome" chant. Um, then it had one of my probably my least favorite spot in the match, which was, you know, again, this is you could view this as a nitpick, but it, this is the kind of thing that really annoys me. Nick Jackson, he did a four fifty splash, <laughs> but there is no, there like of all the potential universes, there is not one where this four fifty splash could have actually hit Brian Danielson in the position he was laying on the mat. So it's one of those spots where, yes, we know that it's fake, and we know you're going to land on your feet, but can you fucking at least do the move in a way where it looks like it's possible that you hit him? So it looked really bad, and it looked really fucking stupid. Um, Roger flying with the sick kick right after did look really cool, so that almost saved it. But yeah, I really hate when they do flying moves that you know have no uh, no possibility of hitting the guy, so that that was really uh, annoying. Um the old uh, flying nothing. The flying nothing, yeah. Uh, Brian did the elbows of death on Nick while Strong was doing like this ridiculous backbreaker on Matt and the apron in the background. That ruled. Uh, and then Danielson absolutely murders Nick Jackson with like the, this kid, these kicks to slaps and stomps in the face. Uh, you know, which took the match up a notch for me. And they locked in the cattle mutilation. The problem I had again, and this took it back down a notch for me, was the ending, which I fucking hated. Where Nick looked... Nick looked like he was completely murdered. I mean, Brian Danielson could not have killed this man more, but then the Bucks just, like, kind of suddenly revive and hit one little sequence and win, which it didn't really work for me at all. It just felt like, you know, Nick was killed this Almost entire... as if, like, they went too far one way that he... it felt improbable for them to, to come back. Yeah, I mean, even if they... I don't know, even if Nick 
acted more hurt <laughs> at the end. You know, if he was selling more or if, you know, they had to do a little bit more to win. It just felt like, okay, you were slaughtered for this entire match. And then Matt comes in and you're just suddenly fine. And you hit your move and you win. It was very, like, it's time for us to win now. Like, it just didn't work for me. So, I, you know, I enjoyed the match. I didn't hate it or anything. I went, I would go, like, three and a half stars, I guess. But they were, like, some major flaws that took it down for me. I think I, I like this match uh, mainly because this is kind of the era when I started watching PWG. So there's some sort of nostalgia factor to it. Well, you um, started watching PWG when you were, like, eight years old? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually. <laughs> I was 13 or 12? 12, 12 okay. 13, yeah. As soon as I started having any sort of money, I was, oh, <laughs> until I started learning what the internet was. Um, I started watching PWG. It was, like, probably my first indie, randomly. Yeah. I, PWG, I don't know. It's, like, it never... I, I, it was coming up at the same time that I was, I guess, still really in the Ring of Honor, so I didn't have time to watch it. And then... You know, by this point, like 2009 is like probably the year I watched, one of the years I watched the least amount of wrestling, period. So, mm. because like pretty much everything I liked at the time was going down and I didn't find, you know, I didn't like seek out anything new. Because Ring of Honor, this is the year I stopped going to Ring of Honor because Ring of Honor started sucking. Um, you know, Noah was really going down. I guess I watched Dragon Gate still, but even Dragon Gate didn't have a good year. Um you know, and New Japan was not yet kind of, like, really ramping up. So, yeah, like, 09, even, like, 2010, I didn't watch a lot. It was, like, 2011 that I really started getting back into it again. But, anyway. Definitely the peaks for me were, like, 2011 to 2014. And that was when I was, like, making sure I saw every show, every match. And then after that, kind of when the UK guys came in is when I was like, yeah, I think I'm I'm waning on the PWG bandwagon a little. I lie, by the way. 20, 2010, I was going to every Jakarta show. So yeah, 2009 would be the year where I wasn't watching anything or going to anything. And then the following year, in, in 2010, which is like the BDK year, I was going to like almost every Jakarta show. It dragged so. you back in. Yeah. So. Anyway. Uh, I don't know what you were saying. I'm sorry I interrupted you. <laughs> uh, I, was just, I was just pointing out when I gave up on PWG. <laughs> what, oh, what was 2014, you said? Uh, yeah, 2015, when like uh, Pete Dunn, Mark Andrews, Marty Scroll started being the focus. Not a big fan of Brit Res, huh? I mean, I like Brit Res in Brit Res. <laughs> okay. I mean, that was one of those things that I've never really watched, so I never really watched a lot of Brit Res. So, uh... But yeah, I mean, PWG is definitely a blind spot for me. I was form, really so. into progress for a while. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people were. I never, I just never really started watching it. So, like, I've seen, like, I don't know, like, seven progress matches all time or something. There you so, go. I don't know. It's like, some some really low number. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Do you have any final thoughts on this match before we move on? No, it was just basically, uh, uh, it was also Brian Danielson's birthday. <laughs> so, he's been his birthday just kicking matt jackson in the head this is like what like f- this is like four months for he signed with wwe i guess because i guess he would have signed yeah about then yeah he would have signed like september so i don't i don't really remember because I, I i went back and looked at like what the fuck he was doing in 2009 and the answer was like he was working a lot of noah which i don't even remember but like i guess he was ghc junior champion for two seconds but yeah i mean he was like not it was like a weird little transition period where I guess you could see why he signed with WWE because, you know, Ring of Honor is kind of like in the, like, the, I, I know, I think some people like the HD Net era. I, it, I think it kind of sucks. So, um, I've seen so little of the HD Net era. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, of... I watched the TV and I went to like one, t- like going to one taping in Philly was like, that was the end of my Ring of Honor fandom, which I had, I had been a fan, obviously going back to like 2003 and I'd gone to so many shows, but like, by 09 I was really like oh eight I was already starting to wane a little bit and then 09 you know the HD net tapings I believe start I could I could be wrong in my timeline somewhere but I think it is 09 I all I know is I went to an HD net taping whether it was 09 <laughs> or 10 and it was so fucking bad it was just so long and so boring that I was like I'm never going to this again <laughs> and that was and I don't think I went to another Ring of Honor show until it may have been not until the first New Japan Ring of Honor show in 2014. 
Jeez. So, yeah, it was a long gap. Really, really uh, did not interest you. Yeah. So, that was like, I think it was like from 09 to 2014 or something. But yeah, so anyway, PWG. Good match. I haven't seen a lot of it. And, uh, you know, you can see it every Wednesday night on Dynamite now. Because it's pretty much, this is pretty much the style that won over, so. When Strong and Brian leave, we'll get a rematch. <laughs> uh, the, the first, or second match we're going to talk about, the first match I picked was Kota Ibushi versus Shinsuke Nakamura from New Japan Pro Wrestling, uh, January 4th, 2015. I, I, you sent me your picks, and I picked this immediately <laughs> when you picked Nakamura and Zayn, because I was like, I have to watch these two back-to-back and see if they copied each other, uh, you know, as much as I remember. And we'll talk about whether or not they did when we get to Nakamura and Zayn, but that's why I picked this match. I, it's also, like, one of my favorite matches of all time. Uh, I assume you've seen it. I mean, I'd be pretty uh, surprised. Yeah, this was... I think the second Wrestle Kingdom I watched live. Okay. Oh, so you started so, with the 2014 one. I think so. I, I started with the one that like Jarrett was all about. Yeah. Well, no, no. I thought so, Jarrett, I thought that was this one. Was this one? Yeah, the one that Jarrett did the paper before. Pretty. I'm almost certain it was this one. I, you know what? You know what it was. I had watched bits of it. This was my first one live, but I had seen the other one. Okay. I paid a ridiculous amount of money to watch this live, <laughs> and then the stream did not work. Uh oh. Like, this was, like, when I had no money because I was just a dumb kid. And I remember I was staying at my father's house and I was sitting on the floor and I dropped, like, $99 on whatever <laughs> pre-looted fight to watch this. And I basically... All I got was the Omega match. And I was happy with that. But all I got was the Omega match that working perfectly. What was the Omega match? Taguchi? Um, Taguchi. It was yeah. his debut. Yeah. The fucking... I, I remember Twitter... Because I, I, I watched this live on regular pay-per-view with the the jeff jarrett global force wrestling tie-in and i remember twitter like fucking lost their shit in a bad way for the the arm chainsaw thing like they were very twitter was very angry at uh the sanctity of new japan being ruined by the arm chainsaw so in a match with taguchi with taguchi it's true uh but yeah so this match is fucking awesome i look of the debate, which I know was a big debate at the time, like what was better, this or the Okada Tanahashi match, I'm I'm solidly on the side of this. Um, it's this, yeah. I mean, Okada Tanahashi is a great match too, and mm. probably their best Tokyo Dome match. I think. I don't know if I prefer this one or 2016. I mean, those two are definitely way better than the the uh, 2013 one because the tw- the 2013 one's really not anything special. The 2015 2016 ones are way better, but I I think this is my favorite this year has my favorite one of the three Tokyo Dome matches. I mean, none of them touch the Invasion Attack match, which is, you know, a, a, like a five-star. Yeah, like one of the best matches. But this one, you know, also a really good match, but Ibushi Nakamura is just way better. Um, How cool was the VTR for this match? Oh, I was going to bring that up too. Ibushi delivering a, a, a snap German to Nakamura. To, it was a like high the, pitched <laughs> yow. It's like be, it's the best fucking challenge, uh, title challenge of all time. Still, so people don't know the story and didn't watch. So Nakamura, he would just beaten Katsuri Shibata uh, in the main event of Power Struggle to retain the Intercontinental Title, and he's basically just standing there talking about how he has no challenger, and Kota Ibushi runs out of the back behind him <laughs> and in one very quick motion gives a snap German suplex to Nakamura while he's standing there talking and that's how he delivered his title challenge. The, the to this day, the best title challenge of all time. Uh, it's it's great because like you expect like Ibushi to drop this massive like line or whatever and he just says like a cat's meow into the mic and you're like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Nakamura should really just start screaming yow again because he'd be way cooler. Even oh, just fucking... watching this match and watching the Zayn match, it just made me really depressed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, what the fuck happened? Other than, I guess, realize... Oh, look, I mean, you, should, you don't have to really ask what happened, I guess, because pretty much everybody... I mean, look what happened to AJ Styles, too, right? So it's like, yeah. er, everybody just kind of gives up there as far as, like... I mean, why why bother, like, killing yourself to have great matches? Did a hell of a lot of good for Drew Gulak, right? I mean, like... Mm. You know, it worked out well. It worked out real well. It's like just get your catchphrase down, make sure the entrance looks good, and that's really all you got to worry about. I mean, as I was watching this VTR, first of all, both men, great fashion sense. Ibushi has always been a hype beast and will always be one. <laughs> um, but I was thinking, like, man, if I looked at the entire New Japan roster at that time and I was starting up New- AW Japan equivalent, the first two draft picks would be Nakamura and Ibushi for sure. Yeah. Like, put them on a poster, and they're going to sell, regardless of even if you know who they are or not. 
Yeah, I mean, they, Shinsuke was like, I don't know, like, I don't, I don't think he does any shots from his wine cellar here, whatever the fuck he had, but he was like <laughs> such a cool ass guy, and he just comes off in these VTRs like the coolest person alive. I mean, again, it, it's just mind boggling that WWE managed to ruin him to the degree they did. Because, like... I just think he was ready. This was his retirement. Yeah, I guess so. But, like, I mean, he doesn't even look cool there anymore. I'm like, at the very least, the guy could look cool still. It's like, they, they managed to make Shinsuke Nakamura of all people fucking lame. It's very, very weird. Anyway. Uh, Come home, Shinsuke, but then, like, <laughs> just be, like, be cool. And don't need to even work a G1, because we know how that works out with you sometimes. <laughs> um... So it has one of my, you know, the entrances are great, especially Shinsuke with the, uh, with all the playing cards in the background because he's the king of sports or the king of uh, strong style. And did that also have something to, uh, I came into play with the Ibushi feud where Ibushi was like the Joker, yes, king or something. Yeah, yeah. that was good. And I like and Tanahashi, of course, has the Ace card, which is great. So uh, it's that was great. What, what a, like, I remember like this entrance was great, and the entrance the year before was really good. But, and then, like, his last entrance against AJ, he just wore, like, some crappy piece of fabric. And I was like, really? Yeah, he was <laughs> like, I'm so disappointed. Well, and then the match happened. It was also disappointing, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'm, not, I'm not, I'm also not one of, the, like, the high people in that match. Yeah, it's like, I mean, it's a four and a quarter star match, I think. But, you know, I think people were expecting, like, the full five. And then, I think people pretend it's the full five. <laughs> yeah, and they probably do. Then they went to WWE and had m- matches that, uh... Could not Ooh. even hit four and a quarter. Was that? Did you? Did anybody like the one on SmackDown? I haven't even heard anything. Is that happened yet? Yeah, it just happened on Friday. I think. I don't pay attention <laughs> to my <laughs> I don't. You're asking the wrong. Yeah, thing. I don't know. I, I I just remember that happened. I was like, wait, wait a, a second. second. They just fought again. <laughs> um. But yeah, so I'm this sure might... was great. Oh, or do we have the delay back? Is that what happened? Oh, no, it's fine. Okay. Part. Okay. So, uh, Shinsuke, he has one of my favorite openings of this match. Shinsuke offers him a handshake, and <laughs> then when Ibushi takes it like an idiot, he immediately kicks his ass. I mean, that's one of my all-time favorite openings to a match. Shinsuke looks so fucking... And look, Shinsuke looks so convincing that you're not even mad at Kota in, like, a you know, your stupid baby face way. Like, Shinsuke looks like, he's like, I don't know, like, the look on his face, he sincerely looks like he's offering this man a handshake. And, like, Koda, I don't know, like, there's a different person that would have done this way over the top and made it, like, you know, Koda, how, what, what a fucking idiot you are, Koda, for taking the handshake. Shinsuke looks like a genial, like, put it here, pal, kind of guy. <laughs> and Koda takes it, and you're like, okay, I see it. And then Shinsuke kicks his ass, and it's awesome. Uh, I remember, like, when watching this, I was just like, "Oh yeah, Shinsuke's a heel." <laughs> it's like you forget because he's so charismatic, but like yeah. he's meant to be a heel. Chaos is a heel stable still. Yeah, um, I, I I guess like they never yeah like they really do not go full fucking babyface. I guess until the year he leaves. So like after he yeah. leaves, like twenty sixteen is really the year where they're just like okay, they're just babyfaces now. Like at this point, they're still really in that like Lij tweener spot, you know, where they're like. Hmm. the true chaotic some neutral. of them are heels some of them are faced yeah and they're like you know if they're if they face the main army they're heels if they face bullet club or suzuki in their face but yeah i mean that's the same spot lij is in now it what really wasn't until 2016 where it was like okay everyone here is just full-on baby face you know fucking goto just, just joined merged. yeah and then they they merged but they didn't they're still considered it, it's so fucking stupid anyway uh this match has the best example ever of coda going to that dark place I mean, he's I done it down here. Serial killer mode. <laughs> he he's done it in a lot of other matches, including the Okada match this year. But this is the best one he ever did. I mean, he was so vicious. Yeah, I mean, he comes up just, just straight up punching him in the back of the head, and like he does those fucking palm strikes. I remember the the, the first time I watched this, I was like jumping up and down when he did that. I was so <laughs> going so fucking crazy. Um, Nak- Nakamura has one of my again one of my favorite moments ever where he like he's tr- like he, he sees that he's fucked so he just takes red shoes and fucking throws him into Coda <laughs> and Co- and that gives him the opening to like hit his own straight right hand such a cool fucking moment and then um right after that we have one of the best counters ever where Nakamura turns the standing lariat into the armbar takedown which 
<laughs> we'll see again in a second. Yeah, I can imagine but, we'll see that later on. <laughs> uh, and then Coda counters it by stepping on his face, which is... Which again. Uh, yeah, again, we'll see that later on. But yeah, and that's, again, all-time great counter. And then this still has, like, you know, I... I I, uh, I think I, I blew past a lot of awesome spots, but I just, you know, I could talk forever about this match. But this still has one of my favorite finishing sequences ever, which is like, okay, so Nakamura is beating his ass with elbows on the mat. He hits this uh, second rope bamaye. Ibushi smiles and rolls through it, which is <laughs> one of the best no cells of all time. They both go for bamayes and they clash fucking swords. Like, they're two fucking samurai or something. Like, they, they hit knees and they both, like, fucking That's react. Shit. And then, finally, Nakamura hits another bomb A for the pin. Uh, you know, I this is, like, a match I've seen, like, 500 fucking times. And it's still always amazing. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's the full five stars. So I mean, the It's easy, one of the easiest five stars. Yeah. I mean, like, what the fuck else would this be? Like, what... I would love to know, like, if there's somebody out there who hates this match. Like, what is the fucking flaw? Like, please explain. So, <laughs> like, it's one of the most universally loved matches I feel in the New Japan ethos. Yeah, and it's also if you want to get your friends to watch New Japan, this is the match you show them. Yeah, I mean, it's like this. I'm trying to think of what the matches I've. I Ishi hear Shibata. Very... Ishi Shibata. Shibata Okada. I mean, this last Okada Naito match, which that surprised me. I thought people would. I, to be fair, I, I I do love that match. I went the full five on it. I think that one is a match that you appreciate more if you know the history. Yes, that's true. But I just meant like as far as universal, universally beloved matches, I really haven't seen even people who normally hate thirty minute Okada matches. I haven't seen really many complaints. You could also about. Um, go Omega Okada three, which is the one I like the least, but it's the more palatable one. <laughs> I fucking hate that match. Just I've ranted about it a million times. I was like, in, I was in the building from an outside perspective. Yes, yes, from an outside perspective, it's true. A match makes. Like, no I think sense. my grandmother has seen that match. Oh, did she like it? Um, she likes the young bucks. <laughs> okay, but she doesn't. She doesn't really like the epics that much. Well, that's, that's fair, Granny. I just want. I got a couple of things that I, I liked from this match that I jotted down. Uh, I really liked how Dorky Koda comes across when doing Shinsuke's shit. Like, it takes a real. <laughs> it takes a really cool guy to pull that off, and like he just kind of doesn't do it. But you love him anyway for trying. Yeah, he looks like he's. Uh, you know, he looks like he's a cosplayer. You know, I mean, that's pretty much it. I remember, the, and there's some really like iconic Tokyo Dome moments to me happened in this match, like Ibushi hitting the Yao and then doing the Bumaye, and then um, the Springboard German, which was just oh like, yeah. Insane. I don't think that's the first time he's done that. I I think, I think he's done it in DDT. Yeah, I think he had done it in DDT, but you know, they the the crowd fucking goes crazy, and you can understand why. Let's, let's be real. There's a lot of people in that dome who hadn't seen that before. Regardless. Yeah, yeah. So I think he actually calls it a swan dive German, which is a great name. But uh That's sick. <laughs> yeah. So awesome match, obviously. Good pick, John. <laughs> uh but your your second pick was Shinsuke Nakamura versus Sami Zayn from NXT on April first, twenty sixteen. Mm. A match I just ranted about a couple weeks ago, so uh, I remember you asked me, like, was that the reason you picked it? I was like, no. Um <laughs> I I picked it because it was being discussed in the Slack. Yeah. And I realized that although I love this match and I, I gave it five at the time, I I hadn't seen it since the year that it happened where I watched it twice in one week. So I think I told this... I did definitely told the story before, but the first time I watched it was I was in Japan. Uh, like <laughs> this was my very first trip to Japan when I went for Sakura Genesis that year. So I guess Sakura Genesis... Let me actually get the date because now I'm curious. I don't know if it... I think it hadn't happened yet, but I think it was the following weekend. Or it was like a couple days later. You were prepping for Sakura Genesis. Uh, oh, not Sakura... Duh. It's called Invasion Attack at that point. Ah, that, was the last, that was the last Invasion Attack. Yeah, it was Which April... Was that? that was Naito winning the IWGP oh, heavyweight title. Picked a good one. Kata. Yeah. So it was April 10th, 2016. So I think I had like just gotten to Tokyo because I think I was there for about... A little under two weeks, so I mean, I I can I have a very distinct memory of um, I had this little tiny hotel room in Shinagawa, the Shinagawa Prince Hotel, which is like uh, towards the south of Tokyo. I had like a single room, which is like it was nice. It was like fifty bucks a, a night, basically, but like uh, very very tiny, but like in a very easy uh, access area of Tokyo where you could access like all the the various other neighborhoods. But anyway, so I remember like coming back. 
I had like I had a bunch of alcohol <laughs> that I bought the at the Kombini. I bought like because uh, I love Japanese beer, and I also bought like these they call them chohais, which is like or chuhais, I think, which is like a basically prepackaged. Um, oh god, what the hell is it? like? It was like I think I had like a it was like grapefruit and soju, but they're so good. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean like so I had a bunch of alcohol and I was sitting there by myself watching. Uh, I was like I think takeover. Had, had happened that morning, Japan time. And I was like, why don't I just check out Shinsuke's debut? I think I watched two matches from the show. I watched, uh, uh, like, a, you know, that night. I watched, like, the Asuka match, which I don't remember what match it was. And I watched That's this. Slightly. Okay, there you go. And I watched this match. And, you know, it was kind of like, well, I want to see Shinsuke's debut. And, you know, it's late anyway. Um, I was not one of these people who was going to get up early and watch WrestleMania <laughs> when I'm in Japan. I blew, I completely blew that off, and I think I've still never seen that WrestleMania. So, uh, I don't... I don't even remember it if that makes you feel better. I, I think it's the Dallas one. I think it's the one with, uh... Yeah, because this is TakeOver Dallas. So this that would have been the one we with the Brock and, uh, fucking Dean Ambrose match I talked about last week. So I didn't watch this Mania. Yeah, so I was like... I, I mean, I told the story before, too, but a bunch of people... Uh, got up early that morning and watched WrestleMania. And I was like, "Fuck this! I am going to a park or something." I'm, I've been waiting. Enjoying to, Japan. I've been waiting to come to Tokyo my entire fucking life, so I am, I'm peacing out. I'm not watching WrestleMania, but yeah, uh, I did watch this match in Japan, and I think I watched it like one other time. But it's been a long fucking time for me too. It might have been since 2016 or 2017. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I've oh, my take on this match was always like, and this is. The take I had watching it, you know, sitting in my hotel room watching it, it was like, this is just Nakamura Ibushi again. <laughs> like, <laughs> and do you think you noticed it because you've watched Nakamura Ibushi a million times? Yes, and I was gonna say that's probably why it really stood out because other people always told me I was crazy, and they were like, "Oh no, you're completely right." <laughs> yeah, okay, I mean, there. I will say, and here's what I will say: there were less repeated spots than I remembered. Um, I thought the actually though I thought the entire match was like a repeated spots. They were, they were less than I remembered. So the people who yelled at me like you're crazy, there weren't that many. I can kind of sort of see where you're coming from. Um, but the problem is, like the match, like you said, is structured the exact same way, and the two big sequences that they took. From the Ibushi Nakamura match, are first of all they're both really iconic sequences, so it's not something you could be like, "Well, where'd this come from?" And they're both recreated move for move in the exact same order. So when you get to those sequences, you're just like, "What the fuck?" Like they might as well have just cut away. They they literally could have suddenly cut from this match to Nakamura and Ibushi, and it would have been the exact same spots in the exact same order. Mm-hmm. For those two, it would like, have been very weird and very confusing for the <laughs> network audience. <laughs> but it would have been the same. It's a pro- so, like, yeah. I mean, uh, there you go. So, it, uh, while I was watching, this, I was like, man, Zayn and Ibushi are like quite similar. <laughs> oh, you cut off there. He said this was like uh, obviously Zayn doesn't do all the flippy doos in the same manner that Ibushi does. But I was just like, oh, I just said that Zayn and Ibushi were like quite similar. Yeah, I yeah. Um, the first thing I want to say, the ring announcer pronounces Shinsuke's last name like shit. Uh, so, very good. He said, he basically says, like, Nakamura! And it's like, okay. It's like, uh... Or, they didn't know. Or, like, Mera or something. Nakamura. I don't know. It's very bad. Uh, I, and, I, I, and I'm saying that as someone who also mispronounces many Japanese names, but sure, you're the ring announcer. Like, maybe, maybe look it up. Maybe ask him first. Or just ask. Yeah. <laughs> um, the first big Ibushi match... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, did you think it was very weird hearing Nakamura's WWE theme without the crowd singing along to it? It was weird, yeah, and it was also weird just hearing it without the the rap now. But, uh... <laughs> I remember, it... like, I, I kind of imagined the crowd singing it. I was like, <laughs> oh, wait, they're not doing it, but, like, in my head, I'm... Yeah. I'm going, oh... <laughs> um, the first Ibushi match echo... Uh, they do a sequence for Nakamura, like, tries to stop, stomp on Sami Zayn's head, misses with the big kick. It was basically, it's not a long sequence, but, like, it's in the exact same spot of this match as where it was in Nakamura Ibushi. So it is, again, it, it stands out, and it's like, okay. Um, 
And then it gets to, it's a, there's a sur- surprisingly boring like early per- early portion which I did not remember at all. Like they don't do a whole lot, and the crowd is like and this is where the crowd is like really annoying and they won't shut the fuck up. <laughs> and it's like <laughs> I got- did notice that too. I was like, wow, <laughs> this is a crowd that I gave a lot of credit to at the time. I remember I was like because it was just oh wow a WWE crowd making noise. <laughs> there's like I don't know there's. Look, here's here's what I'll say about the, these American and especially like NXT crowds. They don't, f- I don't know, like they don't follow the match. It feels like to me, like they basically have two modes, right? They either scream their heads off at stupid chance, or they're dead silent, and they go dead silent for portions of this match. Um, you know, they, they it doesn't feel like they're following the match. It feels like they're barely re- reacting to the actual match. They're not going with the natural ebbs and flows of it. They're just like... I mean, there's a long stretch where they're almost as quiet as a main roster WWE crowd is now. And then when they're making noise, it's just like screaming back and forth. And it's like, can you guys just like watch the match and react to the moves? Like, why do you have to either just be screaming your heads off at stupid chance or like being dead silent? I don't know. It's very... It doesn't... Like, like Japanese crowds for all the, oh, Japanese crowds are quiet fucking bullshit meme. Like, they can go... (laughs) (laughs) They can go quiet for like mat wrestling and stuff but it feels a lot more natural when they go quiet and they it feels like they 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 match the ebbs and flows of the match better and you know and i'm not even like just picking on american crowds in general here because like even AEW crowds uh back when we had those they i felt like time yeah i felt like they reacted to the matches better than like these takeover crowds where, like, yeah, the AW crowds could still get annoying with, like, the chants and stuff. But it felt like they were watching the matches a lot more. With like the it, AW crowds, you'll get a lot of the, whoa, whoa, Yeah, whoa. yeah, exactly. Which, that annoys me way fucking less than... Uh, <laughs> it actually looks like you're paying attention. Yeah. And, like, they, the AW crowds were weirdly, like, not super into... I mean, they could do some annoying chants, but they do not chant all night. Where, like, the, the NXT TakeOver crowds, especially in Mania Weekend... All they fucking do is chant. And it's like, at some point, you're just like, God, can you shut the fuck up? Just watch the match. <laughs> Those damn Brits. <laughs> but yeah. Coming in, ruining the sanctity of the American crowd. Um, but yeah, there's like, uh, I don't know, there's, there's like a, there's a weird bat wrestling portion early where they look like they honestly lose each other at a few points, which I didn't remember. Like, Zane just kind of looks over his shoulder at Nakamura when he does a go-behind. <laughs> like, he isn't sure what they're supposed to be actually doing. I'm just like, wow, for a match that people love that much, I w- did not expect that. Um, go ahead. Roast tinted glasses. Yeah, I guess. Uh, Perhaps. Yeah. Uh, at one point, there is, like, an incredibly stupid spot where Zane essentially, like, backs himself up repeatedly until Nakamura runs himself right out of the ring. See, I kind of liked this. Oh, that looked like a fucking Looney Tunes cartoon. It looked so stupid. I don't, I don't know. I think it worked. I think it works well because of Zane comes across as like this wily kind of guy. It does seem like something you'd see El Generico do, perhaps more than you'd see Sami Zayn do. But yeah, yeah I didn't have a problem with it. Okay, that's what annoyed me. Uh, back to the annoying crowd. For some reason, they break <laughs> into a fucking yes chant during the the yay boo for form exchange. It's like Dana Bryan's not here, guys. Why don't you like everyone shut the, gets a yes? <laughs> why don't you shut the fuck up? And then they stop doing it and they start doing it again. It's like okay. <laughs> um, then we get to like the the sequence where they're like completely ripping off Nakamura Bushi. So Nakamura gets the boot scrapes on Zane against the ropes. Just like Kota Bushi, Zane starts firing up. <laughs> he he hits like a huge lariat. The the one little difference is he hits like three lariats, you know, two lariats before he goes to the, the third one. And the lariats did look good. But then he goes to like the big wind up one and Nakamura takes him down to the arm bar. And it's like, huh. And then they do Again, the sequence keeps going the exact same direction. Nakamura bootscapes him repeatedly. Uh, you know, after Zane gets out of that, Zane fires up. Uh, oh, actually, no, I wrote this again. I'm sorry. So Zane, Zane like steps on his face to get out of the fucking um, to get out of the la- out of the armbar, which is exactly how Abushi got out of the armbar. Um, it's a basic near carbon copy. Zane then starts beating Nakamura's ass pretty much just like Kota did. He even throws the straight right and everything. I throw it's his it's mo- very weird because he does like, I wrote down like it's serial killer Sammy and you just don't <laughs> expect it from this like character. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, it looks like he's cosplaying Kota. And then, you know, Zane 
you know, he, he does the Rose War punches, he bootstraps him against the ropes. It's exactly the same. <laughs> Nakamura comes up and hits his own right hand. The only difference is he doesn't throw the fucking ref into him. So they're all really, really mixing it up there. Uh, and again, this is all the exact same order as it happened in the Nakamura Ibushi match. And they finally move away from redoing it because Zayn hits a, uh, a face buster and a Koji clutch, which is different. So yeah, that's like a two or three minute stretch or something where it's just the fucking Kota match. So, I mean, I I get why people might say, oh, it's not the entire match, John. But like, that's a long fucking sequence. And it's, a, it's probably the most famous sequence of the Nakamura match. Wouldn't you it's say? A significant portion. Yeah. I remember like thinking that like, I, if it was intentional, which it seems like it was intentional, <laughs> I understand why you would do it though. It's like, what was the match that I had that got the best reaction from a Western from the Western fan base? Oh, my Coda match. Well, maybe I'll take some things from that and I'll do it in my debut in front of a major Western audience. Right. I mean, I'm not. I don't really like. Yeah, I guess I'm, I, I get it. I just think like. When people were uh, would argue around Twitter, like, that's not what happened, that would just r- drive me fucking crazy. If you don't care, if you admit that this is the exact same fucking sequence, then great. But people are trying to argue with me that it's not. It's like, just watch them back to back. I promise you'll notice. Um, mm. There's the, the one, like, truly, like, original Austin's Father match comes right after that, where Sami Zayn, he goes for that jumping DDT like, through the ring the ring pose that he does, and Nakamura, like, counters the huge kick. That was really awesome. Um, but, yeah. I and swear, the- though, throughout this entire match, Corey Graves is trying his darndest to make Nakamura not cool. <laughs> what did he do? Like, I mean... he called him Swag, swag Suke, <laughs> which is, like, that's an internet meme. Do not bring it. And he, said, he was talking about how um, Shinsuke is good at all the head games. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Well, Corey Graves sucks ass, so... Uh, and then Nakamura... Oh, we used to think he was good. Yeah, well, we were done. <laughs> Remember when people thought he was good? And then Nakamura hits the bombing in the back of the head, and then another one for the pin, which, again, kind of similar. He does, like, the second rope bombing, and then, you know, Zayn kind of rolls through it. Although he doesn't really no-sell it as much, but it still kind of does faintly echo the Ibushi match at the finish, which isn't, you know... Is it great when you've already ripped that match off repeatedly? Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, overall, I guess there wasn't as much repeated spots or as, as many repeated spots as I remembered but the the stuff that is repeated is so fucking like it's exactly the same so I get why I had that impression um you know there's the spots that stuck out were the ones that were used in both matches yeah um so the early portions of the match is strangely bad the crowd is so fucking annoying um I really don't think this is anywhere near as good as Nakamura Bushi. I do think it's still you know, everything after the midway point of the match is really awesome. So there is a lot of really good stuff in this match, uh, you know, and if you can look past the, uh, the ripoff spots, I, I guess I would give it four stars flat, but, um, to me, it's nowhere near close to the five star, to a five star match. That's not a five anymore to me, looking back on it. What would you give it now? At the time, I could, I, I could understand why I would, but. What'd you give it now? Now. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I think it'd be incredibly disingenuous of me to drop a five star match by like a whole star because <laughs> clearly it did have some sort of impact at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, four and a half, conservatively. <laughs> I see. I think I actually went up. I think I might have given this like three and three quarters, three and a half at the time. So I've become less grumpy about it, I guess. I did find one thing funny that um. Nakamura gets busted open in this match and not the Ibushi match. <laughs> that is kind of funny, yeah. So there you go. Okay, like so... The one where Ibushi's just straight up punching him in the face, he doesn't get hurt. <laughs> no, Zane does it. And he's... Yeah. But yeah, that's that match. Let's move over now to my second pick, which was Tetsuya Naito versus Kenny Omega from New Japan on August 13th, 2016. Uh, I think I had the date wrong when I originally put it out. It's August 13th, not August 3rd, so I hope... Sorry if you had trouble finding it, because I'm an idiot. Uh, this is basically the B-Block final. This It came down to this match. The winner would move on to fight Hiroki, Goku, Hiroki Goto in the final the next night. Uh, Naito, I believe, had 12 points here, and Omega had 10. So Kenny had to beat him to have the tiebreaker and win. Uh, Naito could have gone to the draw and won the block, which they almost did. Um, but yeah, I picked this because, first of all, 
I I was being nice to you when I was like, let me pick. Oh, I was being nice to you. Oh, you okay. Uh, huh, huh. I was trying to pick. I was like, Liam is coming on, so I will pick my favorite Kenny Omega match ever. The match where I have nary a bad word to say about Kenny Omega, and because obviously he's your favorite fucking wrestler, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. And against my favorite wrestler, and I I I will go to my grave saying that this is Kenny's best opponent. I mean, I get why people like Kenny Okada better, but. I love all three Kenny Naito matches. Well, they sure is Naito's best opponent. No, I don't even think he is, actually. But I think Naito's best opponent is either... <laughs> it's close. It's either te- I think it's one of Tanahashi, Kenny, or Ibushi. But, but yeah, this match is like... Uh, you know, I, I don't have any real complaints about this match. It's one of my favorite matches ever, once again. So, um, you know, I'll, they had three matches that I all loved. But this one is just above the other two. Even though Kenny wins, even, so... Uh, but yeah, this is, uh, first of all, the, the first thing I have, the first note I have on my sheet here is the, the spitting spots are probably going to be among the last things to return to wrestling, I think, but, yeah. but Kenny and Naito do, yes, an, Callahan wrestles. <laughs> but Kenny and Naito do an awesome job with them. Um, and they did here again. I like, remember like, as I was watching this live, like that was the moment where I was like, this is exactly what I wanted. Yeah. Like Kenny like spits at Naito and Naito's like, like uh. I really loved the heel heel stable leaders dynamic that they teased the week before. Yes, I mean the heel. It definitely has a big like. I remember when they announced this. Even like you had that buzz like, oh, it's the Bullet Club leader against the Lij leader, and they were both still like very solid heels at this point. Like, um, you know, Naito, I guess was in the process of turning, you know, a little bit because you know when he won the title from Okada. At Invasion Attack, you know, it was with, like, Sonata running in, and Evil and Bushi running in, and, you know, he still had, like, the interference and stuff. And Kenny, at the same time, was doing the interference, too, with the Bucks against Tanahashi. So they were both still, like, very heelish, and in the G1 is when they both kind of got away from the run-ins, and, you know, Naito... You know, Naito was still pretty heelish in that Tanahashi feud. I guess it really wasn't, even though he didn't have, like, run-ins and stuff. I guess it wasn't until the 2017 G1 where he started, you know, going more babyface. And then Kenny was, uh, again, still very heelish, even though they did... I don't think the Bucks stopped... The Bucks didn't run in for him anymore after the, the Intercontinental stuff, right? I don't remember them ever running in again. No, it was it was really just that much. Y- yeah. There was maybe some stuff with Elgin, but outside of that yeah so like this is like when they started keeping the interference only to suzuki goon when they came back i guess but uh Mm. and like maybe other and then jay white eventually but yeah um but kenny i guess like was not and he was still very heelish and he he cuts a very heel promo at the end of this match too but yeah neither one of them would start turning babyface i guess until like really like late 2017 the more i think about it and then kenny obviously Mm. with the the golden lovers reunion and everything uh, but yeah, this was like a big, a big heel versus heel vibe, basically. Like you said, like just two heel stable leaders, like fucking going head to head, and the crowd was super fucking into this too. Like the crowd was like really, I really liked this. that you could hear kind of like the Naito fans on one side and the Omega fans on the other, and at points there would be like both of them names were getting chanted at the same time and they were like me- they were like meshing together in the air yeah and like that i feel like the Naito fans got louder as the match went on in which kenny got mad about at the end but um <laughs> but yeah like the, the the they were definitely a big contingent of mega fans i mean the following year when they met in the g1 final you know even though the Naito fans really hadn't you know i was in the building and even though the the Naito fans clearly had an advantage there was definitely a significant portion of kenny fans and we were sitting next to like a bunch of <laughs> japanese bullet club fans and they seemed almost upset with us for being white people who loved naito i guess they expected how dare you <laughs> they, they were like you are traitors but yeah they were very like they seemed very annoyed that we were like jake fans it was funny uh but yeah the back to the okay so i did write down the one thing that kenny did i that, really um oh go ahead sorry. uh I just wanted to say I, I really love the dynamic that Omega and Naito have together because it really comes across as like genuine discontent, genuine disrespect, genuine dislike. I don't know if there is any actual like heat between the two. There's been some Kenny interviews where he kind of talks about it, but I don't know if that's just character stick or anything. Yeah, I, I've always wondered that too. 
Um, I don't know if there is or not, because he sometimes, uh, you know, he can sound pretty like, you know, like, oh, this this L.I. Lucy Gobernava is saying it only works in Japan and blah, blah, blah. Like, he could sound like an asshole, you know, when he talks about Naito, but, like, I don't know if that... It could. It really easily could just be him working. Because every time they, he did an interview like that, it was always, like, when they had a match coming up. So it's, like, I, I don't really know if he's ever gone to the press to bury Naito without... I don't think he ever has, outside of that context. Like, the, the famous ones I remember, like, I remember him, like, really... Uh, burying him right before their match in the G1, the last one in 2018. But, like, that easy could just been him working the, for the match. So, I don't know. But it, I, I learned a long time ago that you just never trust Kenny Ager when talking a, on a platform because it's probably a work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would be my guess, too. But, yeah, they, do, they definitely do a good job of, like, you know, making the... Like the like like you said like basically getting across they fucking hate each other, uh, but yeah. So Kenny, even in my favorite matches ever, Kenny does still find one way to annoy me, which was when he makes these extreme <laughs> extreme Kenny noises as he like starts selling the knee. But his selling gets better and better as the match goes on. So like the first time he sells the knee, it is very much like, uh, "What are you doing, buddy?" But for whatever reason, he gets. He gets more subtle about it, and he gets less annoying, which is probably why he doesn't bother me here. Um, and then he starts... I, I think this is his best performance ever, especially like when it comes to selling, because he... You know, Nitro doesn't work over the knee for so long that you feel like Kenny has to be selling it every second of the match, but he never fucking forgets about it. And there's so many moments where he... Um, I mean, I can give you the one one easy example. He he goes to do the you can't escape thing, the forward roll, except he doesn't say you can't escape yet. Uh, he says, I could do this all day instead. Um, but like, sure. but he pauses and it's very subtle, which again, if I have a fucking problem with Kenny Omega, he's not subtle usually. But his pause here is very subtle. It's like perfectly timed and, uh, you know, you know, like the, the tone of it is perfect. And it's a fantastic transition spot where Naito drop kicks the leg when he gets up on the second rope for the moonsault. It all looks super fucking natural, and it doesn't have that like hokiness to it where it's like, you know, um, you know, very obvious setup. So that a perfect spot. That that like is a great example. And there's there's more of them as the match goes on where they every time the knee comes up, it's a great transition spot for Naito to take back control. So, you know, that that's probably why this is my favorite of the three matches, because it has, like, the best story to it and the best, like, you know, connecting thread. I mean, the 2017 one, the following year, which, you know, I still gave, like, four and three quarters, It's it's got, like, more spectacular spots, and it has more, like, um, you know, more, more of that to it. But this one has a better story in the match, along with some really spectacular spots, too. Um, Nitro takes, like, this absolutely disgusting bump off an Omega running boot while standing on the apron. Like, he just goes fucking flying into the barricade. And then Omega comes out there and just, like, fucking power bombs him through one of those non-pre-cut tables uh, with such force that the table does kind of break. <laughs> and, like, he just fucking tosses this guy right over the barricade. It's a great fucking spot. And then after that, Kenny hits, like, maybe the greatest dive of all time, uh, which is the... The springboard, Tope Con Hilo, all the way from the top rope to Naito, way out behind the barricade. I mean, just an amazing fucking dive. It's one of my favorite moves ever. Yeah, I mean, that like, is... Straight up. That whole sequence is one of my favorite sequences ever, because it's just like, uh, Naito's bumping is crazy, and then Kenny does that fucking gigantic dive. Alright, folks, we had some technical difficulties, but we're back here in the middle of talking about Naito and Kenny Omega. Um... So we just did the dive, the big dive in that whole sequence, which I think we both love. And right after that, you know, I just put a little note that I appreciate that Kenny's still mm -hmm. remembering to sell the leg late in this match, which, uh, if I recall correctly, I wrote before I wrote, watched the next match, he will not remember to do in the following match. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, then we get the apron side uh, Snapdragon, which is sick as fucking hell. I mean, just like drops Nato right on his neck on the apron and then followed by his favorite thing to do land on his head <laughs> and then followed by another snapdragon back in the ring and Naito is really just killing himself in this match to get this match over um, 
Then we have like one of the coolest counter spots ever, I think, where Kenny tries to lift Naito up for the doctor bomb. And Naito tries to counter it first to Arana. Kenny blocks that counter. So Naito turns it into this like sick ass high angle DDT instead. Uh, that spot fucking rules. I totally forgot about that whole sequence. So that was awesome. This match is full of like those like little tiny bits that you just forget about. Like I had forgot the whole um, forearm German exchange that they had. Yeah, that was awesome too. Yeah, that was Which really ends cool. with like. Kenny just, like, dying on one leg. <laughs> uh, and then Kenny... So Kenny hits the first V-trigger, remembers to sell the knee, which is very, mm-hmm. very good, uh, which again gives Naito an opening to hit this huge swingy DDT. And, you know, again, this match is just laid out so fucking well where every time they do a callback to the knee spot, it's like a, this transition spot for Naito to take back over. It's so great. Um you know, there's this really awesome near fall where Kenny rolls through the top rope Rana uh, into the into the pinfall attempt. That was really great. And then Kenny goes for the one-winged angel, but Naito rolls through it and gets the knee bar, which I always love that fucking spot. It just looks so fucking cool. Um, and then... The knee bar is really sick, too. Yeah. I don't know how often, like, Naito uses that or if that's, like, a, a consistent submission, but, like, I was like, that's good. And Kenny sold it, like, death yeah i don't think he uses that often but i think it's just because like you know he's working on this guy's knees so he's like let me do a knee bar uh and then kenny hits like this awesome deadlift german again still sells the knee finally gets the doctor bomb for another near fall and then we get the second awesome one wind angel counter where naito counters it into the half destino midair which looked fucking great uh Kenny always loves to land on his head, like, viciously for Destino. <laughs> yeah, this is true. Um, and then Kenny does the the Gonzo Bomb counter to the Destino. And Sumo Hall, like, the roof sounds like it's about to come down. So that was great. And then he goes to the Woman Angel again. And they announce, you know, with three minutes left in the time limit, he goes, he starts going crazy. Because, you know, like we said, if he if this goes to the draw, Naito would advance. But the knee keeps giving out on him. Uh, then we get like a really vicious slap fight, and then the crazy V trigger midair counter of the Naito form. That spot looks so fucking good. Oh. <laughs> I mean, that looks. They timed what that. What a f- spot that was. They timed that shit perfectly. Like, it could have been done in a way that it came across super <laughs> sloppy. Like, these two are just such professionals that it just connected so flush. <clears throat> yeah, it looked awesome. And then Naito still won't take the woman to Angel, so Kenny has to turn it into this crazy German suplex instead, and then hits another V-trigger for two. And then finally he gets the damn one winged Angel for the pen. Uh, again, very easy five stars. I think a, pretty much a perfectly laid out match. They do so much crazy shit here. Um, I, if I remember correctly, this either... Did either this, I think this finished second for match of the year in the Voice Wrestling poll that year. It was either... Robbery. It, yeah, it, it either finished second or one, I think. I'm going to look this up because I'm curious. I'm pretty sure it was number two, but yeah. I might be wrong. Yeah, I think it finished behind Okada Tanahashi, which should not have. This was this was, this was the match of the year, I think. Um, yes. But yeah, my Google is being very... If we can agree on it. <laughs> I mean, it was, it's just an amazing fucking match. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find it. Let's see. 2016 <laughs> match. To, I can go while you're looking. Yeah, I, I, I got it on the next... I, I got it loading, so my internet is just being very slow right now. Hence all the technical difficulties, I guess. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like, this is a just an a, outstanding, amazing match. Um, you know, My again. favorite match until, like, the next match we're about to talk about. Oh, no, it did win. It won number one. Oh. Yeah, I got... And that was all thanks to us. 589 points. Let me see. Oh, I got in here. The I, This is a... I got I got like a little note here. There you go. Uh, but yeah, the the second yeah Nakamura Zane finished fourth by the way. So because that was also this year, it was ok- Okada Tanahashi finished second, <laughs> which doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, the Revival versus DIY finished third. I don't even remember that match. It's like I guess they've been they've been buried. I guess so that would much. be the the two out of three falls match that everyone loved. I get. Pro- oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there you go. But yeah, in that Canada. was uh, back when back when NXT was still universally beloved, I guess. Back when it was simple. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so there you go. I'm I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised at this one. I really thought it finished second. So uh, the people were right. They were. 
So the final match we're going to talk about is well, uh, before we jump in, do oh. you mind if I just I got a couple of things that I'd like about the just about the whole uh, three day G one uh, at the time. I thought this was a really good um, that it played off each day because on the first day you had the draw with um, Tanahashi and Okada, which kind of gave some credence to the idea that um, Naito and Omega could go to the draw. Right. And then of course in this match you had Naito destroying Kenny's knee. Which was ended up being used in the Goto match to get a kind of sympathy for Kenny, because yeah. as you, cause Goto just goes full healer when he starts going after the knee, and the crowd gets really behind Kenny in that match. So yeah. I just thought that was good day to day to day storytelling. The the Goto Kenny match I remember being really good too. Not not this good, but I do remember liking. I, it I think I went I went I obviously went five on this. I think I went five on Okada Tanahashi, and I went four point seven five on <laughs> Goto Omega. Just... So I was like hell of a weekend for <laughs> New Japan. I don't think I was also, nearly as high in either of those other matches, but still, like, in the four range. Uh, uh, you'll love this fact I got for you. Um, the next night on... Uh, the, after the G1 Finals, uh, Kenny, I believe, if my memory is correct, was the first time he dubbed himself the best bout machine. Oh, really? After this? Yeah. That was and then cool. um, I, he also called himself the... Oh, you broke Shin Nihon the... Shawn Michaels. The Shin Nihon. <laughs> Which is less cool. The Shin Nihon. Ni... Himself... Yeah. The Shin Nihon Shawn Michaels. Yes. Okay. Yep. What a fuck what a fucking dork. Um Yeah, I love him. He's my favorite wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so the final match we're gonna talk about is Kazuchika Okada versus Kenny Omega from New Japan on June 11, 2017. When you told me you were putting this up in the fan vote, I almost rescinded your fucking invite, sir. Make I knew me it was going to win. Make me sit through a fucking 60-minute match. Well, look, it was it was close at first. The poll was close. <laughs> then two things happened. The Voice of Wrestling account retweeted to its very normal fucking, normie fucking followers. And uh, the normies voted for Okada Omega as they are wont to do. And then Garrett Kidney... Fix the vote, which I would never do such a thing. I definitely didn't do the similar thing last week. But yeah, Garrett I'm Kidney. A, I'm allowed to use my connections. Garrett Kidney quote tweeted twice and told people to vote for it. And yeah, that really. Fair, I only told him to do it once. <laughs> that really swung things the other direction. So uh, you should um, be a shame, a shame, sir. A shame. I'm not because I got to rewatch this match, and which is always a great time. Um, so there's two ways we can go about this, right? Because I didn't for this is the one match I didn't take any notes for. Uh-huh. Um, but as soon as it was done, I wrote a little thing in my notepad, okay. so I could either just read the the whole thing that I wrote down about this being my favorite match, or you can bury it first and then I can do it. No, you can do it. You go first and then I'll bury it. Okay. Um, if it cuts up too much, I'll record it and I'll send it to you. <laughs> no, I think you're. I think you're all right. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> It's pretty hard to define what makes your favorite match your favorite match. It could be that you just think it's cool, that it's a display of mind-boggling athletics, or that it leads to the perfect conclusion of the story you're most invested in. To me, in this instance, it's the ability that the match has to draw me back, to make me, to make me feel as if I'm watching it again for the first time. Okada Omega 2 absolutely fly bys for me. A 60-minute match where the pace is insane the entire time has the perfect amount of drama both in-ring and storyline-wise, while some of the wildest spots I've ever seen are uh, happening. Uh, while also building to just the most epic of conclusions in front of an absolutely molten crowd as loud as you'll ever hear one. I really love this match because Okada feels like the final boss that you just can't beat. He's more resilient than Omega, he's more composed than Omega, and when he needs to hit that next gear, he's simply better than Omega. If this match had gone on a minute longer, Okada would have beaten Omega, and that's what eats him up inside. That's after his lo- That and his loss at th- this year's G1 is what spurs him to make the challenge to Omega, which ultimately costs him the title and his mind for a little while. Whenever Omega gets the advantage in the match, he lets the opportunity slip, either by posturing too long or being too cocky, and towards the end, he knows that this has cost him. I know that some people probably hated the Cody spot, but in the moment, <laughs> uh, in the moment I felt such dread that Cody would come in and steal not only the match from Omega, but this from me. The Bullet Club at ringside really made this feel like a massive deal to me. Matt screaming his lungs out for Omega to get up towards the end mirrored my own feelings. The nervousness I felt, that's, uh, the nervousness that I felt is what makes this match my favorite ever. The fact that I could watch this match three years later with my heart beating in my chest, my stomach in knots, biting on every falsy. 
that's what makes this my favorite match ever. I know it's not for everyone, but for someone who's completely invested, for someone who's watching their favorite wrestler ever almost reach their goal against the biggest force in the company, I hope you can understand why it is. Okay, that was beautiful, Liam. Thank you. Uh, I, I thought it would be easier <laughs> than me writing down spots because I was like, I, I'm just invested in it. I didn't even have my phone in my hand. I didn't check it once. Here's what I'm going to say about this match, okay? I didn't hate it. Uh, you know, I'm not. Oh, if, people, them all. if people if people want me to come out here and completely bury it, they're good. This is the wrong one for that. I mean, the one I fucking hate is the G1 match, which I've buried. I've ranted about in this podcast before. I don't really have to do it again, especially when <laughs> it wasn't the one you chose. But uh, I mean, it, this is still third out of four for me for the four matches. Um, you know, I haven't. I've never rewatched. Actually, you know what? I had never rewatched this or the the following year's Dominion match because they're so fucking long. And, you know, it's not my favorite wrestler in there. So this is the first time I ever rewatched this match. I mean, I've, I, I saw it when it happened, obviously. Um, at the time, I gave it four stars, I think. So it's not like I hated it or anything. Um, hmm. I really hated the idea of sitting through it again because it's fucking 60 <laughs> minutes. And I was very angry for that reason. But, yeah, I mean, to me, the the best one is clearly the Tokyo Dome one. That's that one. I, that's the only one of the four I've ever, I've ever rewatched. And I actually do legitimately, legitimately love that match. This is my number one. The Tokyo Dome match is my number two ever. So. The the Dominion 2018 one I think I like more than this. But again, I've never rewatched it either. Um, I don't think I've even rewatched it. I okay. like I kind of liked sitting in the moment of because like, I remember. I <laughs> let's get into some confession, confessions real quick. I cried at the Wrestle Kingdom match. <laughs> I cried at the G1 win. Uh, and I was completely just exhausted emotionally with this match. With the him winning the title, I kind of teared up, but I didn't really have that same emotional uh, response that I had with these other matches. Yeah, the emotional match for me, obviously, was when Naito won the title, and I was being in the building was obviously incredible, and I did tear See, up See, we're that. different, but we're the same. Yeah, I did cry a little bit for that when he won the title. I mean, there were people, there were, like, women in the crowd, like, fucking bawling. When I don't want that title, like they were just like, re- like crying like crazy. And I was like, wow. But uh, I was like a baby when Omega won the G one. I was <laughs> like, he did it. He finally did it. Um. But yeah. I and then this one. So the, anyway, back to this match. I, <laughs> look, here's here's my big. There's a few big problems with it that I have. First of all, the like stuff, very boring, and mm. goes on forever, and it's completely forgotten. I mean, they never referenced that like stuff. The complete opposite of the previous match, where you know, Ke- where like uh, Kenny sells that leg, you know, for the entire rest of the match, off and on. The the leg stuff is completely forgotten by Okada here after a certain point, and that it really annoys me, especially when they, you know, I, I get it, the match is sixty minutes, so the, the leg portion, the leg portion has to be a lot longer too. But like, they did so much more work on Okada's leg here than they did on Omega in the previous match. And, you know, Omega did sell it for the rest of the match, and Okada here just didn't sell it after a certain point. So, like, that really annoyed me. Um, and again, I don't love that they immediately followed up the the 10 hours of leg work with Okada doing a giant running dive to the floor, perfectly clearing the barricade. Not not great. <laughs> well, um, he just ate shit and hit the barricade instead. Yeah, that would have been better. Uh, he does kind of barely clutch it afterward, but, like, you know, that might be the last time he sells it for the entire match. Um, you know, Okada does hit, like, this ridiculous heavy rain on the apron. That was cool. But we still hit... When we hit the 30-minute mark, I really couldn't believe how little had happened so far. So, not not great. Um, after <laughs> that, it does pick up. Uh, Okada hits the Rainmaker almost on his first try. That's pretty shocking. And I, even rewatching it, I was pretty shocked. I, even though I know Kenny kicks out, obviously. So, I'm sure that was a really cool spot the first time you see it. And you're like, wow, he's going to win already. Um, oh, trust me, I was, like, depressed. I was like, no, 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 no. Oh, I did it. And then Okada hits the elbow drop on Kenny through the table. That was great. And then, yes, just as I'm getting into the match, finally, <laughs> we get the designated Bullet Club drama moment as the match grinds to a fucking halt for Cody to tease throwing in the towel. I, I'm glad you like this. I fucking... I love this spot. I fucking hated this. I mean, look... <laughs> Okada just wanders over to the ropes. He's killing this man. He he's distracted. He oh, d- 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 people. It's an IWGP <laughs> from a have- different stable just showed up. Of course he's gonna be distracted. It's an by IWGP heavyweight title match with 
And he thinks and he's about to get jumped. Event of Dominion. Well, it would be a disqualification then, wouldn't it? I mean, look. Yeah, but he doesn't want that. And it's New Japan. It's probably not going to be a disqualification. Ugh. He wanders over to the ropes and fucking stares at them. He doesn't do anything. He just stares at them. And I'm just like, can you please? Like, this looks like Monday Night Raw. Like, fucking it stop like it. 20 seconds. It's so annoying. And then Kenny, and then after Okada stares at Cody in the box, Kenny magically revives. It's like he's been getting murdered for the past he 10 revives. minutes. I, I can explain this. Do you want me to explain this what? Sure. He revives because he realizes that if he doesn't get into this next gear, Cody's going to throw in the towel on him and he's going to lose. Okay. So this is like his last burst of energy because he knows if he doesn't have it, Cody's throwing in the towel and he's gone. I don't know. I fucking... I mean, if, if you want to, like, sum up why I was happy when the Elite left, this would be the spot to do it. Because it's like, you're in the middle of a fucking 45-minute IWGP heavyweight title match in the main event of Dominion. I do not care about your fucking YouTube series. I do not care about your fucking white person drama. Get the fuck <laughs> out of here. And get the fuck... Get Cody the fuck out of here. Get the Young Bucks out of here. And let, let's just do the fucking match. When Kenny... When Kenny Omega was just Kenny Omega the wrestler, he had a much higher chance of connecting with me. When they had this fucking goofball elite bullshit bleeding into main events and bleeding into New Japan storylines, it always fucking pissed me off. So yeah, mm. Kenny, they, they just need... There was none of that in Kenny and Naito, as you <laughs> as you may have noticed, but they had to fucking... You well, know, Cody wasn't around then. I, yeah. Uh, you know what's funny? Like I think the reason it works for me so much is at the time time i hated cody i hated cody so much and i hated that he was in new japan i hated that he was getting pushed i hated that he was going to face okada at the next show i hated everything about cody being there so when he came out i was like you're not gonna fucking do this to me <laughs> i mean it's just i don't know it just doesn't work for me at all and i, I guess if you're more invested in that stuff it probably did work for you but like I, it, the Japanese fans didn't even really seem like they knew what was going on. So, like, mm. they don't... That was always the big problem. It's like, they don't watch Being the Elite. It's a fucking show in English. So it didn't work for them, you know? And just, I don't know. It's just it, like... They had started playing it up on the shows. It's not like it was just completely out of nowhere. They yeah. had teased the tension between Cody and Kenny. They did, I mean, the fans did not react to it, though. The, the level you'd expect for this big throwing a towel spot in the middle of this. you know what the thing was though when i was watching it the first time i didn't hear the fans because i was screaming no <laughs> that's fair i guess uh, um but like you gotta admit though that last 10 15 minutes well the okay is just that's exploding. well my, and that's my next note like the, the end of the match is amazing like i'm not gonna sit here and argue with anybody if you're gonna tell me the end of the match is great i mean the, there's a whole awesome sequence where um, Okada and Omega like trade a bunch of moves and stuff uh, and even though there's no logical reason why Kenny should be revived it's just I wrote down I guess Ke Cody's mere presence revived him uh, wouldn't it for you <laughs> but yeah and we get the famous one moon angel rope break spot which is a great spot and the crowd is I, you know I'm a fair person the crowd's going batshit I'm not gonna I pretend so they are I was uh, so mad I was so mad and then they, my favorite part of the match, when, okay, Kenny is a fucking idiot, and he does the the <laughs> yes. fucking gun pose for like 10 goddamn hours when we're 50 minutes into this IWGP title match, and that, I was all ready to be really mad at that spot, but then Okada gets up and hilarious the shit out of him, and it's awesome. It's like Okada, Okada made this fucking dipshit pay for holding yep. this pose for that long, so that was great. Yep. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, there... Now here's a spot where I'm probably we're probably gonna disagree. Uh, a lot of people love that spot where Kenny collapses uh, to his it knees rules. when Okada goes for the Rainmaker, and I wrote down, I'm sure that you do too. I always thought yes. it was fucking stupid. Uh, most funny. I was kind of dissecting it as I was watching this match. I was like, is it Kenny just straight up like? exhaust dropping, or is it like all he can do to avoid it is just eat shit on the ground? I don't know what which which what do you think it is? I, I when I first the, the first two times I've watched it, I was like, oh, it's him just exhaust dropping. But I think in retrospect, it's actually him. Like I can't do anything else to avoid this. I have to eat shit and just hit the ground. I mean, I guess that would make more sense because the look on his face is very does not look that bad. <laughs> it's not looked that exhausted, which is always the problem I have with it. Maybe that interpretation looks. It, it makes more sense because well, to me, he looks, think... look, he looks like a guy doing, I am acting <laughs> exhausted. 
<laughs> and I, I think know. it makes more sense to me because like Okada just like flies off and like eats shit and I think that makes more sense if it was like oh, I can't do anything except just eat shit on the ground yeah and then the finish obviously with Okada almost having him pinned I will say you gave the best explanation for why they did that because that never made any sense to me I'm like why would Okada almost beat Ketty like Okada's already beaten Ketty why would that be mm. the 60 minute tease but at least your explanation of that made a little more sense um so I think, he directly references it, like, that the 60-minute draw was, like, his biggest failure in his reign. Yeah. Um, so I, here's the part where I'm going to probably make you sad. I downgraded <laughs> to three and a half. Uh, I, I, didn't li- I just didn't like it as much the second time. I guess, you know, a match where you know it's a draw is always going to suffer, I think, on the second viewing. And, like, the, the first half hour, like, just nothing happens. The leg work goes nowhere. The fucking Cody shit is so annoying. The the good part the good parts of the match are really good, and that's enough to get to three and a half. But like, I really can't go. Any well, item. I actually decided to give it an extra half, and I've broken the scale, and it's now five point five. Didn't Dave I've give taken it six, away your five? Dave gave it a six and a quarter or something, didn't he? Yeah, he, he went above the, <laughs> the Wrestle Kingdom match. Ugh. I Ugh. think breaking star ratings is stupid. First of all, like, <laughs> they're all just fives. Yeah, like four of the matches on this thing that we did i gave fives originally <laughs> wait what one was, has changed but what was the what was the other one you gave five to i gave five to naito kenny five to this i gave five to shinsuke zane and i gave five to the other one that i'm like oh nakamura, uh, Ibushi, oh, nakamura. Okay. so i picked yeah. two matches that you both gave five stars i'm good yep. i'm good well one of them is the most <laughs> obvious match that we would both love ever <laughs> that's true yeah Although you, I'm way higher on the 2017 match than you, as I, as you, I, I don't that. like the 2017 match. Yeah, I love that match. I so. mean, okay, I, I don't yeah. like is very, like, I, I gave it like four stars. <laughs> like, I still liked the match. I just thought it was less interesting. Yeah. And I think a part of it was that I had such high expectations because the match before. What do you think about the 2018 one? It's 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 better than it's like I think I gave it like four and three quarters. Okay. Like, I haven't seen it since, though. I need to go back and watch I'm it. I'm like, I'm five, four, three quarters, four, three quarters. So, that's yeah. my theory. So. Um, I think while we're here, before this goes into wherever it's going to go, we have to get down to the brass tacks, where you call me a Naito hater. You are a Naito hater. I am not a Naito hater. You compared him to I MJF think... in the fucking Slack As yesterday. I meme to annoy you. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations. Mission accomplished. <laughs> I, I don't think... I can be a Naito hater if I have given Naito multiple five-star ratings. Well, everybody calls me a Kenny hater and I've given him multiple five-star ratings. So here's what we've come to learn today. <laughs> Just because we like to bury people sometimes, perhaps we are not haters. <laughs> I mean, look, when Kenny annoys me, he really fucking annoys me. I mean, there well, are Naito matches... Naito just bored me. <laughs> <laughs> there are matches where... Uh, where, like, other people think Kenny is fucking... This happened repeatedly in the 2018 G1. That was probably the worst for this, where, like, people were getting, saying, like, yeah, four and a half on every Kenny match, and I'm, I'm like, no, it was two and three quarters. Like, I, I really... a lot of people got turned off by that, to be honest. Yeah, people really got annoyed at me that, that year. But, uh, but yeah, so, like, I don't... I can't really, uh... Oh, and were you saying people got turned off by me giving them low ratings, or people got turned no, off? No, no, that people got turned off by, like, Kenny getting a lot of high ratings. I see. That time right, period. right, right. Well, I think both probably true. But yes, yeah. Kenny, Kenny, like, really got, like, every single match of his was, like, four and a half, four and three quarters, and it's like, mm. I, I don't know, I just couldn't, like, there was, I remember there was, like, a Kenny ZSJ match that, like, people were raving about, and I was like, what the I fuck? I liked that match. I gave it, like, four and a quarter. Oh, I didn't like that match at all. The Kenny Juice one, also, I think people really liked, and I was like, ugh. That was all uh, right. And Kenny, and then like Kenny Goto, people were giving five, and I was like, "That's four. That's four flat. Mm. Stop being. Stop with the inf- the Kennyflation." Uh, two years ago now. Yeah, it is crazy how time goes, I guess. But uh, <laughs> but yeah. So I don't know. Like, I, like when Ken, like I said though, Kenny, when Kenny annoys me, he really annoys me. Um, mm. There's matches he has where I like it in spite of Kenny <laughs> for sure. <laughs> uh, but then like when Kenny decides to just like okay. When Kenny goes all out and doesn't uh, do, like, the really, really hokey selling or the forgotten limb work or whatever, he can still be really... I mean, like, look, I've given five to the Naito match. 
I went five on even during the G1 I was just ranting about. He he still had a five star match for me with uh, with Ishii. Um, and I'm trying to think what else I've given. Is that the only? You key? haven't watched the Bucks Hangman tag? No, I haven't, that's I, don't know. I haven't watched that. Um, I was gonna make that one of the matches. I mean, you probably should have. What are you doing? I should have done it over the other Bucks tag, <laughs> but I was like, I don't know if I could subject you to like another thirty minute Bucks tag. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I haven't watched that match, and I, I don't know if I ever will at this point. I guess I probably will. Well, if we, ever, if we do a part two of the five, <laughs> I'll, that'll be one of my matches. Um, but yeah, I, don't, I, I haven't seen... I'm trying to think if there's anything else I gave five. Because I was like... I don't think I gave Kenny Okada one to five. I think I gave it four and three quarters. Um, Any Kenny, of the, Kenny Tana matches? No, I didn't. I, Kenny Tana, the new one, I gave four and a quarter. I got four and a half. So like I was gonna say, if you gave that five, I was gonna. <laughs> yeah. So I think that I think those are my only two Kenny fives because it's the Ishii G one, and the because I because I liked a lot of those other Ishii. I liked a lot of his Ishii matches, not the last one. The last one I thought yeah. was very disappointing. But like a lot of his other Ishii matches, I liked a lot. But like at like four and a quarter, four and a half level. Like, what are my Naito matches? <laughs> uh, I Naito Kenny, the most recent Naito Okada. Yeah, I'm... I give that five. I think I gave, I think I gave Naito Ibushi from the G One five, the one I, the one you beat in this fucking vote, sir. Yeah, asshole. Yeah. <laughs> it's the one the Ibushi match that I like. I just don't want to see that combination ever again in my life. Um, I think I gave. What else? I'm sure there was one more, and I can't bloody think. So you gave, I'm sure I gave one Tan- Tanahashi match. Uh, five so you point. gave you gave double the Naito matches five. So you like Naito twice as much as I like Omega. There you go. That's, that probably seems a bit right. <laughs> but you know what my problem with Naito is? Like, the reason I don't like Naito some of the time is that he's really good with the select few people, but as soon as you put him in here with a Sonata or you put him in there with anyone that's like slightly below him, he just is mind-numbingly boring. Hmm. See, I, we, we probably disagree because I love that Naito-Sonata match, which I know some I people like... didn't like, but... The only the only pairing they've ever done with Naito repeatedly where I just cannot stand it is the one that the very easy answer is Naito Minor, and Minoru Suzuki, and even then they even then they have one match I liked that nobody else liked. I liked that last one, the destruction match they had, but like man, that fucking, I mean that fucking uh, what's it called match was really bad. The wrestling, <laughs> Hino Kuni. I remember one. like I have like a really random. Uh, do you remember Okada Suzuki from New Beginning? Yeah, that match sucks. Yeah, I gave that full five. <laughs> okay, I don't, I don't like I, that I, match. I, I realized that that match was like 20 minutes of Okada being in a leg lock, but the entire time he was in that leg lock, I'm like, he's going to fucking tap. He's going <laughs> to tap. I was like pacing, and I was watching him in the leg lock. Like, that's the... I went so high on that match. <laughs> yeah, I didn't love that match. Um, but yeah, I don't know. The, the Where you think Lando was boring, I probably just find him interesting i guess i guess it's just different opinions i don't know yeah, I, yeah. I really like his different character strokes different folks i really <laughs> love his character work and stuff so like even the matches that maybe uh aren't filled with like super exciting spots or whatever i still tend to enjoy so but it's like it'll come up with like his, i think he disappoints me when i don't expect him to <laughs> but then he'll like he'll blow me out of the water when i like when i when i'm like oh yeah whatever <laughs> like i remember I hated most of his Okada matches. I don't like most of them. I think the one that he main evented Wrestle Kingdom with is like legitimately three stars. Wait, what? You um, mean the semi main? Uh, no, no. The, oh, the, the twenty, the second, the twenty eighteen one. I see. Yeah, that one's like a three star match to me. I yeah, like I love, match. I love that match other than the ending. So there you go. <laughs> and like, um, I like the Jericho match that isn't the Wrestle Kingdom match. I hate the Wrestle Kingdom match. I gave that like a dud. Oh, you, but, wait, wait, what is... You hate that Wrestle... Really? I hate I love, Wrestle Kingdom match. I love that fucking match. Wow. I find it so boring. Oh, my God. I, I think I went five yeah. or something. Or four well, and I know, because I remember at the time, I, I saw your uh, post about it, and I was like, wow, that is completely different to my take. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I like... The Dominion, on the, the Dominion one's really good, okay. too. But I, I like, like the Dominion one a lot. I like the Wrestle Kingdom one better, though. The Wrestle Kingdom one's, like, one of my favorite... <laughs> that match is so good. Um... um I was going to say, what do you think of the Jericho Omega match? Uh, I don't remember what I gave. I didn't like it that much. I think I went like four and a half. Maybe yeah, four and a quarter. I was in the three star range probably. Um, but yeah, Naito Okada, 
I see. They, we definitely disagree on that series because I, I don't know if you've ever seen the 2012 match. I love that fucking match, the Corican one. I like the I like the Corican one. Yeah, the, I like the 2014 like one. The awesome. Yeah, that one's awesome. I like the semi main. Uh, I my thing is I like wrestling uh, Stardust Genius Naito way more than I like Lij Naito. I mean, I love Stardust Genius Naito, but that's still quite a take. So, well, I because I, <laughs> I like Tanahashi and I like him being a Tanahashi clone. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, I mean, a lot of people hated Stardust Genius Nato, so I, I don't really know. I, I, I always liked him, but uh, I was, you know, that was not a popular take back in the day, so. Uh, I, like, I, there's oftentimes I'll go back and play an old TW game just so I can book Stardust Genius Nato. Nato and Ishii. Before, like, they before had, the hate. They had so much great matches. They had so many great matches during that period. So, yeah. I should pick one the of those. Never title match. Yeah. They had a bunch and of... And then Ishii had that great match with Yujiro, and I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. Well, Naito and Yujiro have, like, an amazing match in the the 2014 G1. I think they just put it up with English commentary. People haven't seen it. I'm like, pretty that, sure I've seen that. That match is fucking awesome. Like, Naito's 2014 G1, he has a really awesome match with Yujiro, um, an awesome match with AJ Styles, and an awesome match with Okada. So that that's a that's probably one of the best G1s he had, even... What year was the Tanahashi Finals? That was 2013. I think. Yeah, that was fun fact. That was the first live New Japan show I ever watched. Yeah. So the... and I remember um, I was because I had watched the G one, but I had only seen one block, so I, I had no idea who Naito was. <laughs> like, How the fuck did he make it to the finals? I have no idea who this guy is. <laughs> but yeah, the twenty thirteen is the G one. He wins. He gets a bunch of backlash. So by the twenty fourteen G one, the fans really aren't with him anymore. But then he still goes out there and has. Like all these awesome matches, so. Did he have an Abushi match around that time? Twenty. That, that was twenty. That was twenty thirteen G one, I think. Oh, twenty four. Oh, the G one. The the twenty. There's a twenty fifteen yeah. New Japan Cup semifinal, I think. Because the year the year Kota, because there was a time when they both they both had like the matching team gear, but they were facing each other. Yeah, the year that Kota won, they definitely faced each other in the semifinals. So that was twenty fifteen. But yeah. Uh, I really like their tag team. But they I, yeah, they're, anyway. the the Golden Stardust, yeah. Yeah. And then they just Why didn't of, that ever become a thing? I, this is just us reminiscing about <laughs> mid 2010 New Japan now. Yeah. The mid the the problem was like then Koda got hurt and then he left and then they decided to turn Naito heel and it was like you know they never they and can never like, go the back. The tag division doesn't mean anything for five years. Yeah. So because they were clearly setting that up to be like these two. Baby face. There's these like there's these hilarious like photo set of them like having a day around the town. Oh, I've <laughs> seen that. Yeah, and they're like looking at and Nitro does like the fucking eye at, at him in like a photo booth or something. And I'm like, is this like Yowie? Like I don't really. <laughs> I like, mean, basically, <laughs> like it's very, it's very, uh, very, very cool in a interesting way. It's like a what such a time capsule because yeah, then they spend the next like half decade killing each other. But uh, dropping each other on their heads from like top top rope <laughs> pile drivers. Yeah, but yeah, it's a very interesting period. And then like Naito, when I remember the 2017 G1 when when Kota comes back, Naito like buries him in the press. That's not yeah. the match. And he's like, he shouldn't be here. And I was like, yeah, it was great. It's like you were friends. What yeah. happened? What happened? What the romance? I remember like <laughs> there was a time where we really I don't know if they do. You, you'll probably know if they ever actually did this match. But I remember they were like teasing. A Mayu tag Golden Stardust uh, team, like, and I was like, I'm really into this idea. Yeah, I don't know if they ever did it. I mean, I'm gonna look. I was, as you were talking, I was like, let me look it up to be sure because it doesn't, like, nothing jumps out at me. But it's possible they did it on a fucking destruction or something, and I'm just completely forgetting. Because like, I mean, that sounds awesome. It does sound awesome, <laughs> but. Like, unfortunately, Ibushi might have left before it could have happened. Let me see. I mean, somebody's probably screaming. If it happened, someone's probably screaming at their... Uh, yes, it was there, uh, and it was this, and it was four and a quarter. Yeah. All right, let's see. Oh, they did do it. Okay. Oh, no, 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 that's Shibata and Makabe. Ah. They did Shibata and Makabe against Ibushi Knight on a Road of Destruction Korokin. Uh, no, it doesn't... I if it, that's on New Japan World. Yeah, it looks like they never did it. So I just searched Shibata and Ibushi's cage match profile, and uh, yeah, it's there's nothing. So, I mean, the closest we got was a the G1 Ryugoku, um August 16th. There's a six man tag. 
Oh, no, Ibushi's not even in that match. Ibushi's on the other team. What the fuck? <laughs> it was Goto, Shibata, and Ibushi beating Naito, Makabe, and Honma. So. <laughs> That's and, a pretty cool match, though. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the closest we got to it, I guess, was Shibata and Makabe against Ibushi and Naito. So. If that even made tape. And... It probably did. I don't know if it's available. But you know, it's so weird with New Japan World and shows from that yeah. time where it's just like, yeah. half of them make it onto New Japan World, half of them don't. I mean, there's no way it didn't make tape at the time. It definitely it would, would, have, would have been on Samurai, like all the cor- almost all the Corican shows are. But uh, Dave Meltzer gave it three and three quarters. So there you go. According to Casey. But it's like, did it make it onto World? <laughs> yeah. Who knows if it made it onto World or not? Probably didn't. Yeah. Anyway, so that was our, our mid twenty tens New Japan trip down memory lane. <laughs> I mean, yeah. What 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 would you? How would you rank the years, Liam? That's a good. I always like that discussion. If you count the the Bushi Road era starting in twenty twelve, because like I I bet we would disagree on the bottom year because my bottom year is twenty eighteen by a mile. See, I'm not twenty eight. I'm not even that hot on twenty nineteen. I think twenty nineteen might be my least favorite. I like twenty nineteen a lot. I know. I remember listening to War. Actually, I listened to you guys bury it on um, the Wednesday War Games at one point, <laughs> and I was like, no, I think twenty nineteen New Japan is awesome. Um, let me think like of twenty seventeen's I mean. up there for me because that was Kenny's like rise. Yeah, I mean that's so that's a that's a, gonna... a mid tier year for me because it has Naito and Tanahashi, which is still really good. Um, I mean, my favorite year, I think. I think would be 2015. It may be. Because mm. you get like the very start of LIJ at the end of it. You get the... It has my favorite G1 ever, probably, as far as the last three nights, where you have like the Tanahashi-AJ match, the Okada-Nakamura, and then the Tanahashi-Nakamura final, which I, I love all of that. Um, I, the year that Okada had like most of his title matches in that giant run. Yeah. Like, like with the Shibata... So that's twenty. Stuff, that's twenty right? twenty seventeen. Yeah, maybe I do like twenty seventeen, and I don't like twenty eighteen. Yeah, maybe that could be it. Twenty fifteen, I think, is my favorite. Twenty thirteen's up there. I'm, I do like twenty fifteen. I like twenty thirteen. What year was Sakuraba Nakamura? I think it was twenty thirteen, right? Let me see. That's so came because like that match is one of my favorite New Japan matches, though. Yeah, I mean that match is awesome. Uh, I believe that's Wrestle Kingdom seven. Let me double check, which would be twenty thirteen. Uh, I know, very exciting audio. People looking up things on the air. <laughs> yes, that is twenty. I was right. Oh, that we're is just uh, doing that bit where it's like, like hey, remember this? <laughs> <I'm> like, yeah, <laughs> it is Wrestle Kingdom Seven. So there you go, twenty seventeen or twenty twenty thirteen. Wrestle Kingdom Seven, twenty thirteen. Okay. So you're you're right. But yeah, twenty thirteen is awesome. Twenty fifteen is awesome. Twenty fourteen to me is a weird sort of down year in between them, but it's still, I mean, it's still really good. Uh, 2016 I don't love but you know it has one of my favorite matches ever but the rest of the year to me is like very hit or miss and it felt like they were kind of finding their way after they lost all those people at the start of the year and you know there's a lot of the year that I did I mean the G1 until the the final I mean other than that oh, Omega Naito match is probably my least favorite G1 of the era like, see I love that G1 yeah I don't love that G1 at all I did, doesn't... had Nakajima, Elgin, Shibata. Yeah, Marufuji. I don't know. It was. I mean, I love the Marufuji. Maybe I'm being uh, too strong. Maybe, kind of match I love. maybe I'm being too hard on it. I do love that match too, um, but I don't remember that like, as many standout matches as some other years. I think that it might be the most disappointing because we got the start of the Noah New Japan feud and then it never had climaxed. Yeah. So. Um, what year did we not talk about at all? That like I guess I mean 2012 was good, but not on the level of the other ones. I think. Um, so yeah, I guess I would rank them like mm. I think I rank I definitely rank 2015 first. I think so maybe like 2015 one, 2013 two. 2015 G1 is a real strong contender. Yeah. 2013 two, 2017-3, 2019-4. 2012-5, I like the six. earliest stuff uh, with um, Devitt's t- Hill Turn stuff, too. Yeah, it's pretty good. That, that's like 2013. So, uh, But yeah, 20... Because that's basically when I came in, so I'm very nostalgic for that era. Right. 2018 is the bottom for me, for sure. And then, like, 2020 was off to a really good start <laughs> for two months. And I, I mean, I was loving 2020. And then... Well, I had a very good Preston know. Kingdom that I enjoyed. <laughs> Uh, and then I really like the new beginning tour too, but yeah, I don't know. 
That just fucking. Uh, oh, that Kenta match was good. Oh, the Kenta match is awesome. Ugh, how dare you, Liam? I have you on my show, and you bury that match at the end. I gave it four whole stars. So I don't even remember what I gave it. I, let me see if it's even on my wrestling like spreadsheet. <laughs> Actually, I went up to four and a, I gave it four stars when I watched it live, and then the second time I watched it, I moved up to four and a quarter. So. I remember there was one Wrestle Kingdom match that like everyone hated, but you were like, "No, it's good." I swear. Which one was that? I don't know. Which one am I talking about? It might have. Uh, was Sonata involved in something? Is that a saber? Sonata. Did everybody? I don't think everybody hates Sonata saber. I liked that match, but I don't think that was it. It was one match that you were like really positive on, and everyone else was like, "No," and you're like, "No." Oh. You, you could be talking about a lot of stuff. Like, you just don't like it because these people are in it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know which one you're talking about. Uh, was it was it from this year? What what was the date for um Kenta and uh, I don't know. I think it was this year. Let me say Wrestle Kingdom. Kenta, where's this new beginning? In Osaka. Here we go. I gave it three point seven five. It did make the spreadsheet. Okay, four and a quarter for me now. I four stars the first time I watched it. I I moved it up the second time. Uh, what was the Wrestle Kingdom match that I? This doesn't even ring a bell to me. Maybe it was Sonata Zack. I, I thought that match was really good. So maybe that... I guess that could have been it. But I don't remember everybody else hating it. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the answer. I don't remember. Yeah. Oh, I wish I... Yeah. Well, I'll have a look and I'll see you like, later. I'll be like, which one was it? Yeah. I don't know. Anyway. We should probably wrap this up. Uh, it's, pro- it's like, what? 3 a.m. where you are now? So... <laughs> I was going to say, let's just whimper out towards the end of the show. <laughs> uh, Liam... I know you got a thing to plug, so go ahead and plug it. Uh, Yeah, I do a show on Thursdays, Fridays, or Saturdays, depending on my schedule, in which I compare AEW and NXT completely without any bias whatsoever, and we talk about Wardlow, and I used to play the kazoo, but I've retired the kazoo, and uh, there's a lot of karaoke. Garrett will sing Judas, <laughs> and it's basically turning into a political podcast at some points, and it's basically turning into a video game podcast at some point. So eh, who knows what's happening anymore? Uh, I do enjoy the show, so I can go ahead and say, if you haven't checked it out yet, uh, and you're interested at all in uh, AEW NXT, you can check it out. I mean, honestly, the sh- I like the show a lot because the two of you are funny together, and it's under an hour, so it's almost a lot of weeks. It's a very easy listen, so... Uh, I definitely recommend it, even though I'm not a big fan of either promotion. But it keeps me up to date on them, That's at least. That's when we have nothing to say, so we're just like, eh. Yeah. But uh, it's a very very good podcast. The Twitter is at WarGamesPod, which I will say since Liam did not. <laughs> so, there you go. Yes. At WarGamesPod. Just follow Garrett. Just follow Garrett. Uh, and of course, this is Wrestling Omakase that you're listening to. Uh, our Twitter is at WrestleOmakase. Unfortunately, wrestling did not fit. Next week, I have on the... So we already had on Kevin from the Bad Wrestling Podcast. And now next week, we're going to have on Chris from the Bad Wrestling Podcast. So we'll have both Bad Wrestling Podcast hosts on here. Uh, I already saw his three matches. It's quite the quite the departure from this week. So if you thought this week was too heavy on New Japan, next week we'll probably not have any. I'm, I don't think I'm going to pick any for my picks either. So And he, picked, he did, definitely did not pick... Eddie New Japan Pro Wrestling, let me tell you. He didn't pick he picked some interesting shit. So <laughs> we'll we'll get into that next week. So in the meantime, thank you as always for listening, and we'll see you next time.